Okay, thank you. Is that okay if you do that, please? Okay. Okay, thank you all very much. And uh, welcome to those in attendance at this remote meeting of the local review body of Aberdeen City Council on Wednesday, the 20th of April, 2022. Please note that the meeting will be recorded and published online for public access after the meeting. And we also have external people joining the meeting to observe through Teams. Please note that external people should not switch on their cameras or their microphones at any point during the meeting. Can all members leave their cameras on but mute their microphones when not speaking? The microphone should only be switched on when you're invited to speak. As this is a local review body and it contains quasi-judicial business, members are reminded that they should not leave the room or the meeting during consideration of any application. The meeting has been convened in response to three requests for a review of the decision taken by the appointed officer under the council scheme of delegation and also the non-determination of one application. Members of the local review body have also before them copies of the review documents as listed in the notice calling the meeting. I will now ask Ms McBain, the assistant clerk, to outline the procedure to be followed to conduct these reviews and to check members in attendance. Ms McBain, thank you. Thank you. So I'll just do a quick roll call for the recording. So just please state that you're here. Councillor Bolton? I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Donnelly? Yeah, definitely. And Councillor Mason? I'm here. Thank you. So I'll just run through the procedure now. Um, so members have the, pre the procedure note which was circulated with the meeting papers and it is intended to set out the wider framework within which the review process operates. <clears throat> From this, it is clear that the first task for the review body is to come to a decision on whether the review documents contain sufficient information for the case to be determined without further procedure. And by that, it is, it is meant without further information or representations. To assist, I feel it would be helpful to mention the following. Firstly, that the regulations governing the local review process require that all matters which the applicant intends to raise in the review must be set out in or accompany the notice of review. Secondly, that the focus of the review should be on the basis of what was before the appointed officer when a decision was made and only in exceptional circumstances will new or additional matters be permitted to be taken into account. Thirdly, to note that the modernisation of the planning system, which included revisal of the planning appeals process, of which this local review body is part, removed the previous right on the part of an applicant to insist on a hearing and replace that with the LRB, providing them with the power to choose a procedure which more accurately reflects the facts and circumstances of the individual case. And lastly, that guidance issued by the Scottish Government's Chief Planner stated that reviews by LRBs should be conducted by means of full consideration of the application afresh. This review should take the form of a structured discussion led by the chairperson to consider the matter set out in the notice of review before you. And I would conclude by drawing your attention in particular to points 10 to 12 of the procedure note. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much, um, Lindsay. OK, if we could now move on. Um, we will turn to the first uh, applic review in respect of a decision to refuse the application for the change of use of road to provide an external seating area with C three seating pods. Red Robin Records, that's easy to say, <laughs> at 13 Correction Wind, um, application 211339. We'll now hear from the planning advisor, Mr Gavin Ed Evans, who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal. I would point out that Mr Evans attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary professional planning guidance because he's not been involved in the earlier consideration of the application under review. Mr Evans will, however, not be asked to express any views on the merits of the proposal development and in effect his role will be a neutral one involving the provision of factual information and guidance only. Welcome back Mr Evans. Uh, thank you Chair. Um, yep it's a bit of a cameo <laughs> appearance from me. Um, if you bear with me a second I'll just okay. share my screen and we can see the presentation. Thank you. Oh, and I'll just make that full screen. So hopefully you can all see that now. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Great. Uh, so yes, as you said, Chair, um, this uh, this first case is a request for review against an application that was refused under delegated powers for a change of use of road to provide an external seating area for three seating pods at 13 Correction Wind. Uh, the review was 
found to have been submitted with all the necessary information and within the time limit of three months following the appointed officer's decision to refuse. Um, so just moving on, um, the applicant has stated uh, in the submission that notes uh, on the notice of review that no new matters have been raised in the submissions. However, the review documents do include, uh, I think it's 30 pages or more of uh, sort of social media posts and uh, comments in support of the proposal, um, which come from people on social media, of course, rather than interested parties to this appeal as such. Um, so I was just going to pass over briefly to our legal advisor, Mr Thompson, just for a reminder on the test for accepting any new information at the review stage. If that's OK. Yes, thank you, Mr Thompson. Thank you, Gimino. Yes, um, as um, the clerk pointed out at the start of the meeting, this is a quasi judicial um, hearing. Um, so really, what is before the body should be what's before the, the appointed officer who made the decision at the time. Um, new evidence is generally, um, new information is generally um, not allowed in a local review body. However, if the applicant can demonstrate that the new information um, could not have been raised before the time of the body, um, or as a consequence of exceptional circumstances, um, then the body can determine to accept that. And that's obviously a matter for the local review body to determine. Um, and I can always give advice on that in private if you would like. OK, thank you very much, Mr Thompson. Members, I would suggest we do, we don't take the additional information. It, it's social media and there's no way of us verificating it. And I think it's probably safer for any decision that we reach today to be based, based on the information before us. Um, are you happy to accept that, Councillor Donnelly? Yeah, that's fine. Councillor Mason? Agreed. OK, over to you, Mr Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, I'll just... Put my presentation back on screen again there. There we are. So uh, thank you. Just turning to um, a brief description of this site. First of all, uh, the application site's an area of carriageway just indicated in red on this plan. Uh, the, the shop itself, a shop and cafe is indicated in blue there. Um, so it's an area of carriageway immediately outside 30 Correction Wind, which is in use as Red Robin Records, a cafe and record shop. So that's within classes three and class one of the uh, the planning use classes order. Uh, the area in question measures approximately 14 square meters and uh, oops, excuse me. That's just a slightly different view um, and is currently occupied by three timber structures referred to as pods, which have provided additional outdoor seating for the premises during a time of COVID related restrictions. It's understood the structures were initially cited with input from the Council Spaces for People team as part of that initiative. However, they're not formally authorised in planning terms. Um, so this front elevation just indicates the uh, in blue, I've just highlighted the extent of the shop unit and you can see there's these two pens here. This one just uh, just a sort of entry gate and then there's a, a vehicular pen which has some bearing on the, the officer's decision. So we'll come back to that as well. Uh, this plan just shows the internal arrangement of the, the shop unit itself, so not, not drastically relevant um, to what's in front of us. And then this shows the uh, the three pods themselves sitting out on the roadway. Uh, you'll see that they open out onto the pavement uh, with these sort of double doors. Um, sorry, I've just lost my thread slightly. Uh, the three timber pods, excuse me, each measure two metres by 1.2 metres and uh, with an overall height of 1.9 metres. Uh, each has double doors that open out onto the pavement uh, and a single table and bench seating internally with high level windows on the side and rear elevations. Um, so that just shows the internal view with the table and uh, you know a sort of bench seat on either side. Um, overall with just over two meters. And then this is the elevation. So, you know, fairly, fairly basic, fairly modest, uh, not, not particularly large structures um, with a sort of mono pitch style roof. Um, the uh, pods are painted in a sort of graffiti or street art style, which incorporates the logo, logo of the cafe. Uh, we've got some images that, that will show that better. Uh, the site also lies within the city centre conservation area 
and is located between the cartilage of the A-listed St Nicholas Churchyard, which is just on the right behind this wall, and the category B and C listed buildings along Correction Wind. Uh, you can see there's some uh, on-street car parking a little bit further down, but not directly outside the shop. And um, again, that's a, a factor that comes up later. And this is the vehicular pen that I referred to just on the other side there. Uh, so here's some photos of them in situ. You can see the sort of uh, paint finish artwork I was uh, trying to describe and probably not doing very well. Um, and then the Red Robin Records sort of logo on the front sort of looks like it's on the door there as it's open. Uh, this is a view just looking back towards the, the kirk with these in the in the foreground and looking up the, up the slope there. And then the uh, next slide here is on to reasons for decision. Before I get to that, um, I'll just talk briefly about the planning history of the of the premises. Um, so in 2016, um, change of use uh, was obtained from a clinic within class two to a mixed use cafe and record shop within classes one and three, uh, along with associated, associated alterations to the shop front doorway and window arrangements. Um, there were then subsequent applications in 2016 and 2017, which related to the erection of illuminated signage, um, various alterations to the, the interior and the front of the building, there was listed building consent application, and also the installation of a flue to the rear. Uh, so no previous applications to do with external seating or use of the carriageway, I suppose is the point to take from that. Um, oh, sorry, apart from um, in 2020, um, there was an application for change of use of pavement to provide this external seating area outside the premises with three associated enclosures. That was withdrawn, which I assume was on the basis that at that time the council was um, taking this uh, relaxed approach to planning enforcement uh, advocated by the Scottish Government's chief planner. Um, so it was perhaps and mentioned to the, the applicant that it wasn't really necessary to seek planning permission in that context and we were happy enough for, for things to be in the short term. Uh, so turning then to reasons for decision, um, first of all, I should just mention that consent has been sought for these structures for a period of five years um, rather than as a, a totally permanent addition, although you know five years, obviously, some considerable period of time. Um, so the reasons for refusal, um, the decision notice is included in the uh, agenda pack, so you can see those in full, but make reference to the following matters. Firstly, um, the proposed works were considered to have a detrimental impact on the character and amenity uh, of the Union Street Conservation Area and the setting of the various adjacent listed buildings due to the design materials and finish of the pods was also considered to be contrary to policies D1 relating to design quality, D4 relating to the historic environment um, of the local development plan and the corresponding policies from the emerging proposed plan, uh, the, as well as the draft city centre conservation area character appraisal and uh, various relevant sections of Scottish planning policy and historic environment Scotland's uh, policy for Scotland. The proposed siting of the pods was also seen to uh, obstruct driver visibility along Correction Wind and also from the pend uh, that we observed just on the left hand side of the frontage as you're looking towards the unit. Um, that pen serves a parking and servicing area that's in to the back um, and is used by properties along Correction Wind. Um, and it, it was seen that that would impact adversely on safety. Uh, the developments thus contrary or was viewed as being contrary to policy T2 in relation to managing the transport impact of development um, and policy T3 on sustain, uh, T2 sustainable transport of the proposed local development plan as well as the associated supplementary guidance. So turning then to the applicant's case. <clears throat> So again, this is set out in the notice of review uh, with an accompanying statement. Um, the statement was uh, the additional information that we already discussed in terms of social media content. So really focusing on the issues raised in the notice of review. 
Um, the main points raised are that uh, the structures were originally erected during the COVID-19 pandemic when the Scottish Government had endorsed a more flexible approach to such outdoor areas. Uh, the applicant was advised to formally seek planning permission in light of COVID related restrictions now easing. Uh, the applicant had expected the applica application sorry, to be uh, fairly straightforward, assuming that any roads issued had been considered at the time of initial discussions with ACC uh, via the Source Bases for People initiative. Um, I would highlight perhaps that the, the context and circumstances in which those discussions took place is obviously quite different from those against which this application is being assessed. There are no longer restrictions on social distancing, capacity of leisure and cafe venues is no longer uh, reduced to the point where um, you know, they, they have the same need for these additional areas of floor space and so on and so forth. Um, highlights also that there have been no known issues or complaints re regarding the siting of the pods whilst they have been in place. Uh, queries whether the site really lies within the Union Street Conservation Area. Um, that's now been rebranded the City Centre Conservation Area, but I can confirm that it does. Um, contends that the site's not highly visible from Union Street and highlights that considerable care was taken in converting the property for that cafe use originally. Um, the applicant also notes that they would be willing to apply a different paint or finish to the structures if if that's something that members were were so minded to um, to do um, and contends that the visibility display which was applied by the council's roads officers relates to a side road accessing onto a main road and argues that the private car park which is served by this pend and correction wind itself don't reasonably fall within those categories um, highlights also that the level of traffic on Correction Wind is very low and also draws comparison with uh, another unrelated outdoor seating area at Cask, which is a, a licensed premises on Stirling Street off the Green, uh, noting that restrictions on placement to ensure visibility do not appear to have been made there. Turning then to consultations. Oh, sorry, I don't think I flicked onto that second slide there, but just talking about those points. Um, turning to consultations, the Council's Roads Development Management team um, objected to the application, uh, noting that their street occupations team had been consulted and uh, raising the following points. Uh, Recognise that these were granted permission on a, a sort of temporary basis to facilitate social distancing and queries why they're still required as social distancing measures are now being phased out. Gavin, you meant to have jumped onto your next slide. Uh, no, I'm afraid right. there. All right, sorry, one. that's okay, it was just in case. <laughs> no, no, quite quite right, because I do often do that. Uh, the next, yeah. next slides are just on policy, so we'll come back okay. to that. Um, uh, yeah, correct, points out that Correction Wind's a 20 mile an hour uh, speed limit road, um, and a visibility splay of 2.4 metres by 25 metres should therefore be achieved from the pend immediately to the north of the site. Uh, from the submitted information, that doesn't appear to be uh, achievable. And this is why uh, historically this section of carriageway was not available for on-street parking. So if I just flick back to an image here, I think the, the point that's being made by the roads team there is that there has been a restriction on on-street parking in this section because uh, visibility when coming out of here would be would be hindered by it. So the same concern applies to uh, to the location of the pods and um, whether the, it was felt that could be tolerated on a short term basis during the, the height of the pandemic when, as we know, the roads were particularly empty and um, that that's that's maybe something we're just speculating on. Sorry, my phone is vibrating, so I'm just going to turn that off. Apologies. Okay. Um, Roads officers also pointed out that the upcoming uh, demolition of the indoor market, uh, which is now well underway, I think, um, would close Haddon Street and the East Green, which would incur uh, increase vehicular movements. Um, 
not only of residential vehicles, but also uh, waste vehicles and deliveries along Correction Wind and St Nicholas Lane area. So they're highlighting that as a result of those works, there will be more traffic using this road and in particular more larger vehicles such that the visibility display becomes you know, more important even than, than it had been. Uh, Sorry, excuse me. Um, the Council's environmental health team uh, had no objection to the proposal. Um, they stated that in order to protect residential amenity, they would request that conditions were applied in order to prevent use after 10 p.m. and also to uh, prevent um, sort of amplified music or live performance um, within the space. Um, I think it'd probably be quite hard pushed to do a live performance within within these because they are quite bit modest, but uh, uh, the last response in terms of consultations was the City Centre Community Council, and there was no response from those. Uh, and in terms of representations from members of the public, there were also none received. So uh, that's where we are in terms of that picture. Um, at that point, convener, I'll just hand back to you. So uh, just a reminder that the applicant has expressed a view that further procedure is required requesting that site visits and uh, undertaken. However, it's for members to consider whether you uh, you think that's necessary or not. OK, thank you very much, Mr Evans. Um, I obviously am very familiar with, with that particular area and I have been down there several times whilst they've been in situ. So personally, I don't feel I need a site visit. Uh, Councillor Donnelly? I uh, know the site quite well. I used to know somebody lived above it in a flat and when it was first developed, you know, I think about 30 years ago. So I know I know the area and the site very well. OK, Councillor Mason. Uh, likewise, I've been down there several times, so I um, know the area quite well. OK, all right, that's fine. So, OK, we, we obviously all feel we've got sufficient information to, to take a decision today so that we feel there's no further procedure required. Um, so with that in mind, I'll ask Mr Evans if he could go through the relevant policies and considerations, please. Sure. Thank you, convener. Um, so yes, uh, relevant policies. Uh, first and foremost, the sites located within the city centre boundary as identified in the local development plan. So policy NC1 applies um, it's quite high level, but just sort of sets out an aspiration really. Uh, for all development in the city centre to contribute towards the vision which is set out in the city centre master plan for this to be a sort of regional destination. Uh, sets out the city centre is a preferred location therefore for retail, office, hotel and other uses that are going to attract significant footfall. Um, we're obviously talking about an existing use and, and a, a, you know, an individual shop unit as well, so the extent to which that's relevant um, perhaps not too great. Also uh, applicable is policy NC2 because we're located in the city centre retail core. Um, this sets out criteria for assessing proposals that involve change of use away from retail to other use classes. So again, not, not directly applicable in this case because there's no uh, retail use being, being lost. Um, in terms of design quality, Policy D1 sets out that uh, all development is to be of a high standard of design, which demonstrates an understanding for its context and links to these uh, six qualities listed here. <coughs> being distinctive, welcoming, safe and pleasant, easy to move around, adaptable and resource efficient. So just something to, to bear in mind when you're considering the design merits. Um, being located within a conservation area and in the setting of, of various listed buildings. Um, policy D4 on the historic environment is also relevant. This states that the City Council will protect, preserve and enhance the historic environment in line with national and local policy and guidance and offers support for high quality design which respects the character, appearance and setting of the historic environment and protects the special architectural and historic interest of, of conservation areas. So the question there for members really is, is whether you feel these have a positive or negative effect on the, the wider character of the conservation area. <clears throat> the officer's report on this uh, heritage issue noted that these had been accepted, uh, these pods had been accepted on a temporary basis during a time of social distancing requirements. 
Um, however, those restrictions no longer apply and venues would be able to operate now at a normal capacity or something approaching it. Um, highlighted that um, in the officer's view, the materials would not be in keeping with the surrounding historic fabric, which is that sets granite um, the, the substantial granite wall along the edge of the kirkyard and uh, the associated list of buildings on correction wind. Um, the officers report consider that the presence of those uh, of the proposed structures for five years would detract from the special character and appearance of this part of the city centre conservation area and the setting of the St Nicholas churchyard. So um, that, that was the, the view that the officers come to on that particular point. Policy T2 relates to managing transport impact of any development um, and links to the transport and accessibility supplementary guidance for parking standards and other matters. Um, the officer's report highlights the response from the roads development management team and its comment on the position of the pods restricting visibility uh, from or traffic exiting the pend, um, which is used in servicing properties on correction wind. Highlighted that this area of carriageway, as I mentioned before, has been historically kept free from on-street parking bays in order to maintain that visibility. Um, Scottish planning policy uh, is really just um, consistent with local development plan, as you might expect in terms of its approach in the historic environment. <coughs> Excuse me. Setting out that changes to a listed building should be managed to protect its special interest while enabling it to maintain uh, an active use. And special regard should be considered could be given to the importance of preserving and enhancing listed buildings, their setting, and any features or architectural interest or historic interest they may possess. In this case, we're not directly affecting a historic building. It's more about the setting of uh, of those surrounding buildings. Um, but it, it does say that the layout, design, materials, scale, and siting. Um, of things that will affect a listed building or its setting should be appropriate to the character and appearance of the building and its setting. Um, also that proposals within conservation areas should preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area, so entirely consistent with the, the local development plan position on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, their policy for uh, policy for Scotland um, sets out the following key principles, and um, these are all relevant to a greater or lesser extent. And um, perhaps HEP two and HEP four most uh, particularly. So HEP two stating decisions affecting the historic environment should ensure that its understanding and enjoyment, as well as its benefits, are secured for present and future generations. And HEP four. Changes to historic assets in their context should be managed in a way that protects the historic environment. Opportunities for enhancement should be identified where appropriate. And if detrimental impact on the historic environment is unavoidable, it should be minimised and steps should be taken to demonstrate that alternatives have been explored and mitigation measures put in place. In this case, of course, we're talking primarily about um, setting and context um, as far as the historic environment is concerned. And then, as I mentioned, we're in the city centre conservation area, uh, conservation area. So the character appraisal for the city centre conservation area is one of the, I think, the most recent one that's been undertaken, dated August 2021. <coughs> this plan shows the conservation area boundary in red. Highlighted the site with the yellow star there, just for reference. Um, the conservation area appraisal identifies three distinct character areas. The site lies within the Marshall Street and the Green character area, which includes Correction Wine, the St Nicholas Church and the churchyard, uh, as well as various wider areas. <clears throat> um, you'll see uh, within the conservation area character appraisal at 2.24, this uh, states the evidence of the development of medieval Aberdeen around St Catherine's Hill can still be seen today in the street patterns of the Castlegate, Shipro, Nethercourtgate, Correction Wind, Aquine, Flower Mill Lane and Carnegie's Bray. So that's just giving you an indication of the, the age of this uh, particular part of the city. 
views out of the central character area into the kirkyard and over correction wind and the greenery and historic feel of these areas are seen as giving important contrast with Union Street. Um, and those views also highlight the undulating nature of these streets, which people often assume to be flat. Positive characteristics of the um, character area include its streetscape uses and activity, signage, both street and shop signage, and the high quality of materials in key areas. Negatives include building maintenance, street bins, vacant units, and a gap site adjacent to the back wind steps, so no specific references to correction wind within those. Views along Union Street, uh, views, sorry, from Union Street along correction wind with St Nicholas Kirk are noted as being important within the character area. Um, although if I just flick back to I think the site plan's probably best. You'll note that I think the, the views are perhaps from this point um, primarily, and you can see that the, the position of the pods is slightly around the bend. So I'm not sure to what extent they're they're hugely prominent in those views, if you see what I mean, because there's an open bit here where the <coughs> where Union Street crosses over correction lines and it was under and you, you get a good view there, but not sure that the pods are, are terribly visible in that view. <clears throat> um, so at 7.51, the appraisal states that smaller, more enclosed streets like Ship Row, Flour Mill Lane and Correction Wind are reflective of that earlier medieval time period. <clears throat> Although these medieval streets have had a number of modern buildings constructed along them, they still retain that distinctive historic character, which should be retained as some of the last remaining streets of this type. So I think setting out that there's a degree of rarity value to these uh, these medieval streets within the city centre character uh, conservation area. <clears throat> Note so the manner in which Union Street flies over correction wind emphasises the difference in topography and um, the proposal wouldn't, wouldn't alter that. Uh, notes that Correction Wind is enclosed by both the St Nicholas uh, graveyard walls and the flats opposite, and that the solid high graveyard wall is a very strong feature in this part of the character area. Uh, the graveyard wall is also, oh, sorry, I just paste the same text twice there. Um, at 7.71 and 7.72, the appraisal notes that Correction Wind is pedestrian focused in its treatment and materials with the original set still present. So. I think just highlighting that it's not a particularly um, heavily trafficked road. <clears throat> At 7.76, uh, shop signage on Correction Wind includes particularly high quality fascia signs made of timber with console brackets uh, of, and of appropriate proportions. So um, suggesting that a degree of care has been taken to, to ensure a sensitive approach to the historic context. <clears throat> So um, just summing up points for decision making members, um, first and foremost, in terms of the zoning of the site, do members feel that the proposed structures are consistent with the vision for the city centre as required by policy NC1? Um, are you satisfied that the developments of a type supported by policy NC2, bearing in mind that there's no retail use lost? <clears throat> On the historic environment, do you feel that the proposed works preserve or enhance the character and amenity of the conservation area and the setting of nearby listed buildings as required by both the LDP and uh, national guidance and policy? Uh, on design quality, do you feel that the design quality is of a standard appropriate to that historic context? And on transportation and roads matters, do you feel that the proposal adequately addresses the impact of its development um, on the surrounding road network, bearing in mind the, the points raised by the Council's Roads Development Management team about use of the access? So ultimately, just coming to a conclusion on whether you feel it complies with the development plan policies in the round, and then whether you feel there are other material considerations that weigh either for or against, um, bearing in mind, for example, the the issues raised by the appellant and their submissions. Um, happy to assist with any questions or in the event the members are minded to approve any conditions and I'll just hand back to you there, Chair. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Mr Evans. OK, members, questions for Mr Evans. Um, Councillor Donnelly first. Yeah, um, just on the uh, the driver visibility, um, I noticed there's no double, I know it's a low residential area, but I noticed there's no yellow line or double yellow line to indicate perhaps an issue in the past or the current. And also, I didn't quite follow the um, the concern from the demolition squad of the uh, indoor market is to honestly, would they be driving trucks, you know, under Union Street up St Nicholas Lane onto St Nicholas pedestrian bit and then onto Union Street to get out of the city? So I don't really follow. I mean, I don't know what route they're going to take when they demolish it. Maybe it's a bit access around, which is happening now at the base of the green, but I don't really follow the the concern. So just on the on the visibility issue, yeah, it does. It is a narrow, narrow street. It's low usage of, of, of residents and difficult access. You know, so was that the reason there's no yellow lines? I think the reason there's no yellow lines is um, it's not shown terribly well in the photograph, but there's there's signage stating that it's a pedestrian zone. Um, I, th I think that it's not always necessary to have double yellow lines as long as you've got um, equivalent signage. I think it's an alternative to having um, the double yellows painted on the road, maybe in more sensitive historic locations or cobbles. I'm, I'm not 100% sure of that, but the view from the roads officers was certainly that there there is no um, available on street parking in that particular section of the carriageway. In traffic furniture, street furniture, and is there a 20 mile per hour signage on that bit of um, correction line? Uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's for pedestrian use only and you mentioned 20 mile per hour and it's for pedestrians, so you pedestrians. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's for pedestrian use only. Um, I'm just saying it's a, a pedestrian zone um, beyond a, a certain point where it's for access only. Um, there, there is a 20 mile an hour speed limit. That's what was advised by the, the roads development management team. So uh, I think you could, you know, have an it's expectation. A that... Yeah, I think that. OK. okay. Um, Councillor Mason, have you any questions? Yes, uh, convener, I, I, my, my questions for, at, at the moment are very much on the same, same line as Councillor Donnelly. I mean, do is there an estimate of the increase of the traffic lightly as a result of the market development. Can, can, can that be quantified? Because the, the, the traffic um, density, as it were, at the moment is quite is, is very low. Um, you hardly see anybody on it. Whereas, uh, and, and the scale of vehicles, you know, I, I appreciate it will, might, might increase the question of by how much. Whether it can be quantified, uh, I couldn't tell you, Councillor Mason, um, but certainly not by me. Um, we're just going for the purposes of the review of the information that's before us, and that's the um, response from the Roads Development Management team, which includes a comment suggesting that there's a likelihood of increased traffic as a result of, uh, of uh, the market works and the, the associated road closures. So that's that's really what we're going on. OK, thank you. Councillor Donnelly, did you have something else? Just to come back on a different theme, um, on the uh, the presentation, uh, the policy on our outside sort of seating that we've granted in the past, the president's cafe culture, continental cafe, where does that sit with this? As that hasn't been mentioned at all this morning that I've heard of. Um, the encouragement of um, what we've done, uh, for example, in Five Pub in Union Street and other places and, and the pods and the, the green, is there any talk about that kind of relevance to this application? What specific policy are you referring to, Councillor Donnelly? Well, is it part of the master plan that we encourage, um, which we believe I have in committees that have tended before COVID, that we have the city has this cafe culture policy of um, looking at more outside. I think in, in, uh, I think in recent um, council meetings, there has been discussion about um, the development and evolution of the city centre master plan um, with a view to encouraging cafe culture in particular. <laughs> and I'm aware that there is some sort of brief being developed for, uh, I think, Belmont Street. 
but I think that's still something that's sort of evolving um, and doesn't form part of the development plan for, for our purposes and decision making at this point. But, you know, I mean, in general, the city centre is the most appropriate place for that type of cafe culture and certainly makes a contribution to the vi viability and vitality of the city centre. So there is there is something to be said for supporting in principle, but it's really down to the, the detail of an individual proposal in front of us today and the, the particular merits of that. OK, thank you. OK, Councillor Mason, have you any other questions? No, not at the moment. I mean, it, it, it's um, I'd, I'd like to reflect on what, what your comments are. OK, right. Well, at the moment, I have no questions. So if there's no further questions. If in accordance with the procedure notes circulated, the re local review body will now discuss and decide which uh, manner this review is to proceed. I would highlight that all representations relating to the case have been considered and taken into account. So I suppose if I if I add my my kind of comments, um, as I say, I didn't have any questions because the information I had was quite clear. Uh, whilst we want to encourage um, cafe culture um, as much as possible, and some of these side roads are, are are very applicable for that type of um, arrangement. Um, I have to say that I'm not a supporter of this uh, particular element that's been added on to Correction Wine, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful historic streets that we have in the city. And I think it needs special treatment. I'm not saying that something um, appropriate couldn't be located here, but I'm afraid for me, uh, what's currently in place, I think the officer's uh, conclusion is absolutely right. Um, I think the design of them are basically painted sheds um, and I don't think it adds to anything of the historic environment in fact it detracts so the impact and given that we have a legal duty to enhance the historic environment um, within our, our city and protect it um, I feel I couldn't support this application um, with what's currently there at the moment as I say I'm not saying that maybe there's not some sort of um, outdoor um, op operation that could be put in place, but what's there at the moment, um, I think it does have a negative impact on the conservation area. And I think the, the conclusion that officers have come to is the right one. So, you know, I wouldn't be minded to to, to overturn this decision. Um, I would certainly leave the door open that there could be further discussions. But again, it would be a very um, take a very sensitive application to add to the character. And I think it's really important that, you know, it's really nice to see a record um, shop there with um, a bit of cafe. I think it'll bring a certain um, number of footfall and a, a, a particular client in that area. And I think it'll be welcome, but I think we have to get it right. It's not just about anything because we want cafe culture. And that's why, if you recall at the last meeting, um, I think it was at full council where we said that there had to be, and it was, yes, related to more Belmont Street, but about working more closely with the officers to make sure that we have a quality offering in terms of what our cafe culture will look like. Um, because we were criticised quite heavily during COVID for what was allowed to be put in place. And obviously a lot of that um, was done very quickly um, because we wanted obviously to support business and to make sure that people's businesses survived because of the COVID restrictions. But I think we're now at a time where we can we can take control back to make sure that what we're doing is planning for the future rather than planning on the hoof. Or it wasn't really planning because it didn't wasn't required. Um, it was um, a temporary position. So you know, I think what they're trying to do, I can understand, but I think this is the wrong um, offering that they're making at the moment. So you know, I'd welcome to speak to officers, but I would be supporting the officers' recommendation on this. Councillor Mason. Yes, thank you, Kavina. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm not concerned with the the, the traffic. I think. I think yeah. that could be that could be managed. Uh, the, the, and it, even if it's, even if it increases and, and the scale gets higher, I think it's still manageable in that in that area. But I I I, I have a similar view as to you in terms of the quality of build. It, to me, it looks like it's a, a garden shed. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, 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 and that's not what we want. I, I actually would like to see lots of um, street cafes and you know, whatever, because they, they look good, they, they cause excitement in the city, and then, you know, and they're usually inviting. But this is, this is not inviting. I mean, I, I, I have a shed in my garden, and I can go there if I want a, want a shed and, and for a cup of coffee. Um, this, this doesn't enhance the process. I think we, I think we can do better. And, and, and I think, the, the, I think the, um, if pushed, I think the cafe would do better as well. So a, a, a further application of a much better quality bill, I think, would be a very attractive proposition, but not this one. Yeah. Councillor Donnelly? Well, perhaps a condition could be the refurbishment of the uh, the sheds, as you call it. Demolishment. <laughs> yes, uh, no, refurbishment. Um, well, as you know, the sheds on the green, the sheds in uh, Stirling Street, uh, do we start taking them down? I have a concern here, um, you know, COVID's over, it's all finished, we're all back to normal. I'm afraid that's not the case for, for many people. And um, it's a five year uh, application. And I mean, I'm very sympathetic to conservation areas, don't get me wrong, but, you know, uh, over the last two years, we've kind of, um, you know, um, went and done charter waters as to looking after the conservation areas through the proxy of, of COVID. We've had to, um, you know, close down roads, uh, put in unsightly um, infrastructure, uh, bus stops or, or whatever. That certainly hasn't enhanced the uh, the look of the of, of the city centre or the whole appearance of the, of the, the city centre. Um, I'm tempted to go with the um, well, I would uh, oppose yourselves. I'll go with the 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 appeal, the the applicant, you know, on on the grounds that um, I think perhaps um, continuity. I um, uh, the other uh, the precedence has been set by other. Uh, premises that have been there for, and then Cafe 52 on the green, which is a good cafe, well, well supported, uh, um, uh, you know, has been there. I think that was a temporary um, uh, application. I think it's supposed to be there 15 years and it's doing well and I don't have any issues with that. Uh, as far as traffic's concerned, as I says, it's low residential and uh, don't have any issues there. Perhaps, yeah, the, um, you know, one of the conditions I would have said was that the you want to demolish them. So what do you put up pods in their place? So they come back with a fresh application for pods and then is that accepted? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I just feel that um, at the moment we're not out of the danger zone completely. And you may think that we might have to, you know, undo or do things that we've undo or, or redo them at a cost of businesses, say, Councillor Paul, you know, to demolish things and to, you know, I know in, in my constituency there was about nineteen, twenty thousand pounds spent at the back of my my local there in in Ferry Hill to uh, put a, a, a wine terrace on or whatever. I mean, you got a bit of a grant, but it was all the worry and the work that was done. And for for, for to be told, you know, you don't have planning permission, just dig that up. That twenty thousand pounds worth of work. And uh, you know, if we get another spate of viruses, we'll put it back down. I, I'm just a bit concerned that may happen. But um, I think. On that, I think that uh, we should support businesses, and I think by giving them this five-year consent, um, would have certainly found this out, with, maybe it's fully out with COVID restrictions or the impact it's had on our lives, every part of our lives, uh, wouldn't wouldn't have been a problem. C considering just a few feet down the road, we've got what you see as sheds, Councillor Bolton, and that don't look particularly pretty in a conservation area, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. OK, so just to sum up, um, obviously um, myself and Councillor Mason have accepted the officer's recommendation um, based on the policies that they've used. Um, and, you know, I, I think we were both quite clear that, that we're supportive of cafe culture, but it has to be in the right place of the right quality. And it's easy to identify other um, outdoor areas but it's all about the appropriateness for that space and correction wine with a, a large wall at one side and quite high buildings at the other side um, becomes almost tunnel-like and I think it's really important. Paddy is in. I know I just thought I'd get tunnel in for you Councillor Donnelly. Um, I think it's really important that the quality of design and that adds to and I think Councillor Mason was right where is a if the applicant gets it 
right that actually it'll bring more footfall past this door and hopefully in through the door. So, you know, this is not us closing the door on it, it's opening it, but for a high quality design that will actually add to the character of the, the conservation area. Um, so I think, uh, Ms McBain, do you need to take a, a vote because there's a division? No, that's fine. So um, I've just noted that yourself and Councillor Mason wish to uphold the officer's recommendation to defuse and Councillor Donnelly um, was hoping to approve the application. But on that basis, there's a division, so the application will be refused. Mr Evans, sorry, I've just seen your hand. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I just wanted to check um, both yourself and Councillor Mason um, expressed some uh, reservation about uh, one of the reasons for refusal to do with the visibility display. So I just wanted to check in terms of the reasons that we're giving, would you like me to restate them with the exception of that one? Well, no, I mean, I think the visibility displays, um, I think the visibility concerns that the roads team obviously have, you know, it would then, if anything came forward, we would just have to give consideration because obviously road safety is imp incredibly important, but we don't think it should be a showstopper. It's really what I think we're both saying, isn't it, Councillor Mason? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Right, so I'll just restate the reasons as, as previously given in that case then. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks yes, very much. That's great. Yes, because the new any new design would have have to be taken on its merits, including the including the transportation and visibility situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Evans. Okay, thank you, folks. We'll now move on to turn to consideration of the second review in respect of the decision to refuse the application for the installation of security fencing at Woodland and Henry site, Stonywood Park, Aberdeen. Uh, reference 210657. We will now hear from the Planning Advisor, Mr Gavin Evans, who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal. Again, I would point out Mr Evans attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary professional planning guidance because he has not been involved in the earlier consideration of the application under review. Mr Evans will, however, not be asked to express any views on the merits of the proposed development and, in fact, his role will be a neutral one involving the provisional factual information and guidance only. Mr Evans. My presentation for the... Oh, sorry, I was muted for the start of that. I was just saying <laughs> thank you and uh, I'll just share my screen with you. Screen. There we go. Sorry, bear with me, members. I'm just uh, juggling a laptop that's got my my own notes on it as well. That's okay. I'm just trying to keep my my iPad and uh, not closing down on me while I. So yes, that I don't Mankeep's going to sleep. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Uh, yes. So the second case here, um, again, is a review against uh, delegated refusal. Uh, this one being for the installation of a security fence at the Willard and Hendry site. Um, Stonywood Park, Aberdeen. Again, the review was found to have been submitted with all the necessary information and within the three minute, uh, three month time, time period uh, following the appointed officer's refusal. Uh, the notice of review advises that no new matters have been raised in the submission. And in terms of procedure, the applicants have stated that they're satisfied the review may proceed to a conclusion with no further procedure. So not, not seeking a site visit in this case. A uh, quick description of the site. Oh, sorry, I'm scrolling in the wrong screen. Uh, the site comprises existing industrial premises, so there's a workshop, yard and parking. And there's a view from the council's mapping system there that gives a slightly clearer view, um, along with adjacent undeveloped woodland areas. Uh, the industrial premises are accessed via Stonywood Park within an industrial estate. Uh, the officer's report notes that the woodland forms part of a larger woodland area which is required to be retained as a public open space in association with the adjacent housing development to the south um, but has been purchased by the applicant. Um, directly to the east of the site is a public path within a wooded area which functions as an important link in the recreational uh, pathway network along the River Don. Uh, the site's bounded to the south by a suds pond developed as part of the housing development and to the south of that lies uh, the housing development itself, which was allocated as Opportunity Site OP17 Stony Wood 
in the Aberdeen Local Development Plan for approximately 425 houses. There's an aerial photo there just to give you an indication of the, the fairly sort of densely planted woodland that we're, we're talking about, albeit with industrial um, development on the edge of that. <clears throat> uh, a mature woodland and tree belt uh, extends westwards from the site parallel to Cedar Avenue. So that's just what you can see if you can see my cursor here going along yeah. this way um, towards uh, Stonywood Road. And these trees are protected by a tree preservation order um, and uh, are understood to have been part of the woodland policies originally associated with uh, the Stonywood estate. A separate tree preservation order was served on the mature woodland within the current application site in 2020 to prevent uh, those trees being removed or felled without prior uh, agreement of the council. So this this site plan really tells us quite a lot in terms of the, the proposal and the history as well. Um, so the proposal is for the erection of a metal chain link mesh security fence within the woodland area. Uh, it's the yellow dashed line that you can just see here. So it's steps out from the, the historic boundary, comes down and then tapers back in to the to meet the corner there. And then the thicker green line is a blackthorn hedge that's uh, proposed to be planted along its route as well as a bit further to the north as well. Um, the, the purple dashed line here is an unauthorised fence that has been erected by the applicant. Um, uh, red, obviously, is the site boundary. So um, I'll come back to a bit more background on the uh, the, the unauthorised fence shortly as well. Mr Evans, just while you've got that up, can I just check that the yellow fence, it's just on the, the only goes, it doesn't seem to go along the bottom, is that right? That's right, yeah, because yeah. the the historic boundary of the plot was along here and then up where you've just got the black line there. So mm -hmm. I think there was an existing fence there, uh -huh. and then the applicant, having purchased additional land, mm -hmm. uh, has then enclosed that. Um, that's subsequently been the subject of various applications that I'll, I'll just cover. But then this is a, a sort of a second attempt, if you like, at trying to enclose part of that space. Okay, thank you. Um, so the yeah, the the current proposal is for the erection of a metal chain link fence uh, approximately three meters to the east of the boundary of the industrial estate, i.e. the original fence line, so it's stepping out about three meters from there, uh, running parallel to the original eastern boundary. The 1.9 meter high chain link fencing would be supported by galvanized steel struts at three meter gaps and that fence would then be topped with three horizontal strands of barbed wire to achieve an overall height of 2.32 meters. Um, the southern end of the proposed fence line, as, as I was describing, tapers in to join the southern boundary. Um, the area of open space that would be enclosed or uh, encroached upon would be approximately 180 square meters. And uh, as I mentioned, a blackthorn hedge is to be planted along the uh, the outer edge of the fence um, to soften its appearance to some extent. In terms of planning history, uh, sorry, that's just a, a fence detail to give you an indication. So it's 1.9 metres for the mesh part and then the, the additional barbed wire sits above that. So overall height of about 2.3 metres. And uh, that's that's from the... Uh, I'm just checking. I haven't got a, a site history slide. I'm afraid I don't, so I'll just talk to this part. Um, so in May of 2012, um, the Stonywood residential development was approved for 425 houses subject to a legal agreement. <clears throat> in March of 2019, an application was withdrawn, having sought planning permission for change of use of uh, the the amenity land, if you like, west of the historic, um, sorry, east of the historic industrial boundary. So basically everything between, sorry, my mouse isn't tracking terribly well, everything to the east of the historic boundary um, and, you know, now enclosed by the unauthorised fence I mentioned, um, 
So in, in March of 2019, that application was withdrawn, having sought a change of use for that amenity land, uh, sort of woodland, to allow for industrial use, including installation of a new security fence, erection of a workshop with offices and staff facilities and car park, etc. Um, in October of 2019, an application was refused for um, essentially the same the same works as I understand it, change of use for amenity land to industrial use, including installation of security fence around the enlarged site, formation of yard space and car parking. Um, and that was partly retrospective, so some of those works had been un, uh, undertaken. An appeal to the Scottish Government um, Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals was subsequently dismissed. So it has been through some process. Um, so that purple dashed line that we're talking about has been the subject of an application. It was refused and albeit along with other change of use and other associated works and has been appealed to the Scottish Government and dismissed. Um, in September of 2020, uh, an application sought permission solely for the installation of the security fence, uh, again along that purple line, um, and that was that was also refused. Um, the officer's report uh, further highlights that an enforcement notice uh, was issued seeking removal of the unauthorised fence, uh, and that was served on the applicant in 2020 with a deadline for compliance in June of 2021. Uh, that enforcement notice remains live um, and has not been complied with, so the, the fence shown on that purple line is still there. Um, the officer report also draws attention to some of the comments uh, on the existing unauthorised fence from the Scottish Government's decision letter, uh, which describes its unpainted uh, metal finish as incongruous and more prominent than the previous black fence. Uh, also points out that the fence was considered to significantly detract from the amenity of path unit path users. Um, this is the footpath that's relevant to, to matters. Just so essentially that that unauthorized fence runs right along the boundary of the footpath within the woodland. Um, and the reporter's view is that the impression of walking through a woodland is diminished as a result of that and that it would distinctly change the character of the open space. Um, with the experience shifting more towards a path which skirts the edge of a woodland beside an industrial area rather than walking through a woodland itself. Um, should note that the proposed fence remains of an unpainted finish. It's galvanised steel wire mesh, albeit the blackthorn hedging has been added to soften its appearance to some extent. Um, and obviously we're talking about a different alignment of the fencing as well, so it's been pulled in from um, the, the unauthorised fence to enclose a smaller area of the open space, and it's now set back off the path by a sort of varying, varying degree. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, that was the fence detail. Uh, this is the arboriculture, arboricultural assessment plan, uh, <coughs> so indicating the presence of existing trees. Um, there are no trees to be removed um, as a direct result of this proposal and the officer's report notes, you know, there's there's no significant impact anticipated either. Um, I've got some photos here just to illustrate things. Um, this one's to the south, so that's the Suds Pond um, and that's the existing fence in situ there, so you can get an indication of what that looks like. Uh, so this is obviously the edge of the residential development where it sort of joins and the path starts heading through. Uh, this is the, the existing footpath that we're talking about and the, the fence hard up against it. And then this is obviously the building in question just over on the other side. Um, so this just gives you a feel for the character of that path as it runs through. This is uh, a section where it's set back from the path and that's obviously slightly different. Um, this one's not actually of the proposal itself, but it's from the applicant submission, just highlighting a similar type of fence um, along uh, a residential 
street in Cedar Avenue, albeit you'll see there is a, a degree of setback um, off the path. <clears throat> oh, so I did I did actually have a, a slide with this on. I just put it further along than I recalled. Um, so I can come back to that if you like, but uh, I suppose the, the main point I'm trying to make is that there have been a number of applications and uh, we've reached a point where uh, the unauthorised fence has been refused, it has been dismissed by the Scottish Government. Their reasoning, it's really for members to decide whether you feel their reasoning still applies to this realigned fence that's now before us, um, which is, if you like, a sort of compromise offering. But bearing in mind, of course, there's still a, a decision, uh, an enforcement notice outstanding as well. So uh, the appointed officer's reasons for refusal, uh, these uh, highlighted the following matters. Firstly, the impact on residential amenity highlights that the industrial character and appearance of the fencing, uh, bearing in mind it's uh, taught by barbed wire, would detract from the adjoining residential path and open space, resulting in an adverse impact on residential amenity and conflict with policy H1. Um, it would also restrict access to green space or open space. Um, denying access to an area of woodland which forms part of that consented housing development and would conflict with policies NE1, NE3 and NE9 relating to the green space network, urban green space and access and informal recreation for the local development plan. It's also recognised that some planting is proposed in mitigation, however that was not, not felt adequate to outweigh the loss of and denial of access to this area of open space. <coughs> also notes that preventing access to an area of open space required as part of the Stonywood housing development would be inconsistent with the vision and aims from the development framework and master plan approved by the council for that particular site. And lastly, uh, an issue of precedent. The officer contended that approval here may risk establishing an undesirable precedent for similar proposals and um, cumulatively eroding and uh, the extent and function of areas of public open space or woodland around industrial areas. Uh, then turning to the, the applicants or the appellant's case. <clears throat> um, so uh, a, a review statement has been lodged and is included in the agenda pack. Uh, main points include um, offering some background on the business, past works and applications um, and the importance of site security to the applicants. And uh, noting the previous approval of a footpath in such close proximity to the existing industrial use um, departed from the original master plan. So I think uh, the applicants making the point there that the original master plan for the Stonywood uh, site had that footpath located slightly further away from the industrial use. So in approving a plan which departed to some extent in terms of the alignment of that path from their own master plan, the council has, I suppose, brought about this uh, this conflict. Um, albeit there was still a, a woodland separation between the path and the industrial use. Um, as, as I've mentioned, the applicant has purchased some of that woodland and then sought to in, increase their site, which is realistically a contributing factor there as well. Uh, highlights that the proposed alignment of fencing would allow for a landscape buffer to be included uh, between the existing footpath and the adjoining industrial use. Uh, contends that the fencing design has been altered to address issues raised in the earlier appeal decision and avoid impact on trees. Uh, also introducing the hedge planting offers some screening or softening where its route remains close to the path. Points out that a similar style of fence can be seen within a green space network context on Cedar Avenue. That's the, the earlier slide that I showed you. And contends that the proposed fencing is more compatible with the character of the adjoining residential area, whilst offering security and enclosure for the applicants. And second slide just on the appellant's points. Um, argues that the fencing would not undermine the enjoyment of the wider area of public open space, uh, argues that the area of green space network which be, would be enclosed from public access is comparable with other industrial uses locally and really it, it forms a very small part of a much wider area of woodland. 
um, also suggests that the criteria within the Householder Development Guide, supplementary guidance, uh, relating to the incorporation of open space into private domestic gardens should be applied to the assessment of this application. And I think it will be highly irregular to do so. Um, that that guidance is specifically targeted at sort of small leftover bits of greenery that sit on the edge of garden boundaries and someone might reasonably want to to just put a fence around um, as opposed to this, which is quite different. Uh, argues that the circumstances of the case are not shared by adjoining sites and therefore there's no real risk of an unwelcome precedent and further applications of this nature. And notes that the planning authority has in the past stated no objection in principle to a boundary fence. Um, I can't really comment on that. <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, that's on to policy slides. Um, in terms of consultations, the only relevant uh, consultation was with Dyson Stonywood Community Council, who offered no, no comment. Um, there were four letters of representation received, all of which stated objection to the proposal. Uh, copies of these are included in the agenda pack. <laughs> the officer's report includes a summary of the matters raised, um, just a high level uh, summary. Those include uh, the visual impact of the fence, its unsuitability in a residential setting, the prevention of public access to an open space, the potential adverse impact on trees and wildlife, uh, concerns regarding further delay in the ongoing enforcement action per the notice already issued by the Council, and uh, a perceived conflict with the relevant local development plan policies on green space network, trees, access and recreation and residential areas. So um, at that point, Chair, I just hand back over to you for members to decide if you if you feel any further procedures necessary. Thanks very much. OK, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gavin. OK, members, we need, now need to determine whether we have sufficient information before us to take a decision today. Councillor Mason, are you content? Oh, you're on mute. Can I ask you a question first? Yes, of course you can. Yeah, um, can we get, can you go back to Gavin, go back to the, 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 the layout um, map? Uh, bear with me a second, Councillor Mason. Just give up. <clears throat> Here we go with this one. That one, yes. Well, on the, just, just how far west does the the, the open space go on, on in, inside the, the the inside the the purple area, as it were? Oh, uh, a measurement. Um, well, no, I mean, how, I mean, we, we've got the green. If if the fence was constructed, the green the open space would go up to the green up to the green line. But it, it, is the open space? Does it continue further west? Technically, further west than that. Uh, yes, it goes to this black line, which is where the historic sort of property boundary was. Um, so, following this line down, and then this line across that's the historic industrial plot and then but what's in, happened in, is okay in the in the in the, in the north uh, does it go continue north or go to, to hit west at the end of the building at the end of the building it continues north yeah following this green line so that is that is that is so to the west is 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 industrial to the right is open space Yes, I mean this is this is enclosed within the applicant's site, as I understand it, but it is nevertheless woodland and uh, is zoned uh, as part of a, a residential area. I believe I don't think it's it's subject to the business and industrial zoning that the remainder is. Right. So by putting up that fence, it doesn't indicate that the the, the, the area west of that green line can be. It, 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 you know, it has to remain open, open space, in other words. Uh, yes, I mean, it, it doesn't affect a material change in use. Um, this is solely to do with the physical erection of the fence, but I think what the officer's report is highlighting is that by enclosing that space and preventing members of the public from accessing it, to all intents and purposes, it, it ceases to effectively function as an area of open space, if you see what I mean. It's, right. it's still green, but it's on the other side of a fence. Okay, so so notionally, if it's 
if it, it is open space by correct by therefore it, it, we cannot give permission for a fence because it, it closes off the open space is that what, what, what we're saying that's that's really the crux of the the appointed officer's decision i think yes is that to to enclose it sort of stops it from from functioning as as public open space because it's no longer publicly accessible so so where where would where would the the, the applicant put his fret put that once it, how so he, they could have no security in that as a result of that is that right Ever. Um, well no do you want to, i was going to say do you, um this we're just at the stage uh tom of deciding if we need any additional as an in information is that are you trying to get to that rather than i'm sort of trying to get to that because i'm trying to try to visualize at the moment where we're, you know what, what what extent we're looking at and and, and have you got any picture just... photographs that might be helpful to show what exists currently in terms of i, I can see where uh, tom's trying to understand the difference between achieving security for the, res the the business, but you know um, what? I know that this horrible, or, or the sorry, hor uh, it's not horizontal. It's this curvy line, and um, the red and sort of purpley thing is what's there at the moment, unauthorized. But pr prior to that going in place, was there another fence, Gavin? You know, down the side. Yes, I believe there was a fence along the existing property line. Okay. And um, so I, I don't think it's the case that the site was just previously it's entirely achieved. open. Um, I think it's that they, they wanted a replacement fence, but rather than putting it where the existing one was, they put it somewhere else. Does that help? OK, okay I, 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 have, I, have, I have enough information, I think, yes. OK, uh, Councillor Donnelly, do you feel you've got sufficient information? Yes, I've got sufficient information, thank you. OK, and I have also, so with that in mind, my computer's just gone to sleep on me. Hang on to six. Um, OK, uh, Mr uh, Evans, if you could then take us through the policies and considerations, please. Uh, sure, Andrew, can you that? Yes. Uh, sorry, sharing the screen is always the fiddly part. Yeah. Uh. So uh, first and foremost, um, the site does form part of a, a residentially zoned area, so policy H1 applies. Uh, the tests for new development in such areas are, are as stated here. So firstly, is this overdevelopment for a given site? It's obviously more enclosing rather than, uh, than increasing floor space or introducing buildings. Uh, would it have an unacceptable impact on the character and amenity of the area? Uh, that's for members to consider what you feel the character and amenity of the area is presently and to what extent that might be sensitive to to change introduced uh, thirdly would it result in the loss of a valuable and valued area of open space again it's up to you to fix in your own minds what you feel the value of the space is uh, you may, may wish to note sorry the reporter's earlier comments on the existing unauthorized fence um, and consider to what extent those are still applicable to this slightly different alignment. Um, would point out the proposed fence will now be, just for reference, between two and a half and 7.5 metres away from the footpath. So the, the unauthorised fence obviously sits right hard up against it. So now that setback is between two and a half and seven and a half metres. And the uh, Blackthorn Hedge has been introduced as well. Um, Policy D1 relates to quality placemaking by design um, and introduces these six essential qualities of good placemaking. So uh, distinctive, welcoming, safe and pleasant, easy to move around, adaptable and resource efficient. I think the middle two are perhaps most applicable to this, safe and pleasant and easy to move around. We've obviously got an existing footpath, but it's to what extent this undermines its, its sort of attraction as a, as a recreational route. Um, policy D2 on landscape highlights that development should be uh, informed by existing landscape character and should conserve, enhance or restore existing features and incorporate them into a landscape design hierarchy that provides structure to a site layout, should protect and enhance important views of the city and its townscape, and should provide hard and soft landscape proposals that are appropriate to the scale and character of development. Um, perhaps looking at larger scale developments really rather than individual individual fences. Um, 
policy NE1 on the Green Space Network. Uh, the site lies within the Green Space Network, so this applies. Sets out that the Council will protect, promote and enhance the wildlife access, recreational and landscape value of the Green Space Network. Um, proposals for development that would be likely to destroy or erode the character or function of the Green Space Network will not be permitted. Uh, where woodland infrastructure projects, or sorry, where major infrastructure projects or other development necess necessitates crossing the Green Space Network, such developments should maintain and enhance the coherence of the network, and in doing so, provision should be made for access across roads for wildlife and outdoor recreation. <laughs> Master planning of new development sites should consider existing areas of green space network and identify new areas incorporating green space network. Um, as we heard, that's something that, that would have formed part of the Stonywood master plan process, um, which obviously didn't envisage, uh, you know, the industrial uses encroaching into the existing woodland. Um, master plans will determine the extent, location and configuration of green space network within the area and its con connectivity to the wider network. That's where we in, uh, had the uh, new footpath introduced as part of those residential proposals. Policy NE3 on uh, the urban green space areas. Permission will not be granted to redevelop, redevelop <coughs> areas of urban green space for purposes other than recreation and sport. Um, exceptions will be made where uh, equivalent provision, equivalent alternative provision is to be made locally. So effectively, if you want to develop an area of urban green space, you have to provide an alternative somewhere else. Um, in all cases, development will only be acceptable provided no, there's no significant loss to landscape character and amenity. Uh, public access is maintained or enhanced, That's perhaps of particular relevance. Um, the site is of no significant wildlife or heritage value. In this case, there are no specific designations apart from the tree preservation orders that I mentioned before, and the officer's report was satisfied that there would be no um, direct impact on tree or losses. And that's relevant to the next point in terms of uh, no loss of established or mature trees. Uh, um, replacement green space of the same or better quality should be provided. Uh, again, no replacement green space is provided in mitigation for the area to be enclosed. Um, and no adverse impact on water courses, ponds or wetlands. There is a pond directly to the south, but uh, that's not affected by the proposal directly. Uh, policy NE5 uh, on trees and woodlands sets out a presumption against development that would result in the loss of or damage to trees and woodlands. Um, that make a, a particular contribution in various different ways. Uh, buildings and services should be cited so as to minimise adverse impact on existing trees and future trees. Uh, measures should be taken for the protection and long term maintenance of existing trees um, and applications affecting trees uh, are required to include details of tree protection measures and compensatory planting. Uh, as I mentioned, the officer's report is satisfied that there will be no direct impact on existing trees as a result of this scheme. Uh, policy NE8 relates to natural heritage and covers things like protected species and ecological designations. Um, there are no specific natural heritage designations applicable here, um, and we've obviously covered trees separately under the earlier policy. Policy NE9 uh, relates to access and informal recreation. So this covers things like core paths, rights of way and other footpaths um, and sets out the new development should not compromise the integrity of any such routes. Wherever possible, development should make new or improved provision for public access, permeability and or links to green space for recreation and active travel. The path in question is not a core path, but it is still protected as another footpath uh, by policy NE9. Um, so it's for members to consider whether the fence would compromise the integrity of that route. Uh, also, would the proposal make a new, uh, make new or improved provision for public access to it um, and associated links to recreational green space? So just a final slide on sort of summing up and decision making. In terms of the zoning, uh, it's a residential policy H1. Um, would the proposal satisfy the criteria set out 
by policy H1 with particular regard for those on the potential loss of open space and the extent of any impact on the character and amenity of the area. Design terms is the proposal of an appropriate design quality appropriate to its setting. Uh, would it have an adverse impact on landscape setting under policy D2? Uh, would the proposed fencing result in any adverse impact on the character or function of the green space network under policy NE1 or result in the loss of or damage to trees and woodlands under policy NE5? Would it satisfy the requirements of policy NE3? And would there be any adverse impact on natural heritage designations under NE8? Finally, would the value of existing access and recreational routes be maintained per policy NE9? So again, just coming to a conclusion on whether you feel the proposal as a whole um, accords with the development plan. And then from there, are there any other material considerations that weigh for or against the proposal? For example, consultation responses or the points raised by the appellants. I'm happy to take any questions or, or uh, advise on conditions. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much, Mr Evans. Uh, questions for Mr Evans. Councillor Donnelly. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, just on this unauthorised fence, so, so I get it that um, that's been unauthorised and there's an order to remove it. It's obviously being ignored. Um, you mentioned also historically that there's an inner fence that would have been a, the original boundary, fence boundary to the premises. And more or less this inner fence is going to be kind of replaced by this fence. That's what it looks like to me. So where does this inner fence come in? Is this inner fence called planning permission? Or is it the original boundary to the premises that doesn't need planning permission? Um, the, the current fence isn't in the same location as the existing fence. So it's, it's that that we're looking at. I don't know whether the existing fence has planning permission or not. Um, I, I can't really. So but this right, there's two fences. There's the one that's by the path more to the east that swirls about a bit, and then there's actually a boundary fence inside that to the west. That is an historical fence that this fence would be replacing. Is that? Have I got that right? I'm not sure if the historic fence, the original fence, is still there or if it was replaced at the time that the the new fence, the unauthorised one, was installed. And um, so I can't say with absolute certainty. Um, Has the uh, applicant said anything other than the report that if they were granted permission today, that they would be liable to remove the, to, 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 to build the outer fence, it's unauthorised fence, we're going back the the one that's to the far east, that they, they construct that many years ago, a previous owner of the site construct them. Have they said that they're kind of not in denial, but they're willing to, could be a condition, to remove that if we give them permission to build this new fence close at the proximity of the building to the west? There's a few points in there. <clears throat> um, so. Yes, the current applicants were responsible for the construction of the unauthorised fence. Um, and it was they that the enforcement notice was served upon and continues to apply to. Um, I'm not sure what commitments have been previously given by them in terms of removing it, but regardless of that, the point is the planning authority has issued an enforcement notice which compels them to do so, and they have failed to, to, to comply Excuse with me. that. Um, uh, sorry, I think I lost the second point. Um, I think he was asking um, if if we're minded to um, overturn approved. the refusal, um, yes. could we then condition that they could only put that in place once they'd removed the unauthorised fence? I think that might be procedurally questionable, Councillor Donnelly, um, particularly in the context of the, the enforcement notice. The, the Council has enforcement powers that it can, can use, and I think that's the appropriate route to sort of keep those two things quite separate and, and have us just focus on the the alternative. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. fair. Okay. okay. All right, Councillor Donnelly. Well, once thing, um, you said uh, you're, you're not happy with barbed wire. Um, 
Neither am I, but there are alternatives. Could would that be a possible condition that the top had like inward uh, fencing at the top for the height and not necessarily bob wire? Could that be a condition? I think it may be reasonable to condition sort of limited adaptation of the fence. Um, so you could, for example, you know, ask that um, notwithstanding uh, the submitted drawing, the the barbed wire should be omitted from any fencing to be erected sort of thing. I think that's within the scope of what we could achieve with a condition. Um, but you know, you need to be mindful that you can't fundamentally change the nature of the proposal. So you, you could you could do that. You could do something like, for example, specify that the the mesh part of the fencing should be, you know, the sort of plastic coated type and it should be a particular color, whether that be black or green or whatever else to be yeah, yes, yes, in yes, your view, whatever is most appropriate. OK, um, so yeah, there are options. OK, okay thanks. thanks. Councillor thank Masson, have you got anything? Yes, Kavina, I, I still, I'm still a uh, little, little I'm confused about the status of open space. Um, given if they construct this green fence with the with the hedge, that will prevent access to the area to the west. Does that mean the area to the west ceases to be open space? No, no, the top bit. So, so it remains open space even though you don't have access. Yes. Because open space is a land use designation. The fact that somebody else owns it doesn't change its material no, planning no, use. Yeah, owns it, but the, the prevention of entry. I mean, yeah, the, the prevention of entry of... doesn't stop it being open space, but it does obviously prevent public access, which means that it is open space with limited value in terms of its enjoyment. So it renders it, you know, less worthwhile. So it's got more biodiversity uh, value yeah. as opposed yeah. to use as open space. Yeah. Right. So, so that is there any reason why, if that, if if that open space north of the building and, and west of the green line. If that that seems if that remains open space, that means that they they that they, they will never be able to develop on that area. Is that correct? Is there such thing as just permitted development rights for commercial, Gavin? I know obviously there is for residential. There, but. there are permitted development rights for industrial uses. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not entirely certain of the situation with the the land immediately to the north to the north because it's not frankly subject of the proposal that's in front of us and um, we're talking about hypothetical further extensions or alterations within the industrial site i i don't know what bearing that really has because okay. i mean is there any reason why the the, the the security fence can't simply go along the along the north edge of the building and and probably have access uh, to the north of north of the of the building. I, I don't know, frankly, Councillor Mason, but that's not something that's proposed to us, and that's not something that we could take a decision to require today either. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm just I'm just trying to get in my mind by by virtue of allowing a fence, you're you're create you're cutting off open space. Is that correct? You're, you're restricting access to it. You're yes. restricting access. Yes. Does that help you? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, uh, do, 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 at the moment, uh, the, the the unauthorized fence is, is has, should come out, and therefore, given that, there will be no fence at all. That's what I'm not certain of, Councillor Mason. That's that's what I was saying previously. I don't know whether the original fence was removed at the point when the new and unauthorised fence was installed or whether both currently exist um, in, in parallel. I'm just trying to work out what the options for the uh, occupier, you know, where because where, where, they, they can't go on existing with no, presumably with no security. 
especially uh, could I maybe ask Gavin, could you, you bring the photo up or the, the picture up again so we see the extent of loss of open space to the north? Or the proposed new line is basically what I'm saying. I would just highlight or reiterate that mm -hmm. members can go on a site visit if they choose to do so. This is now live. We have about two weeks left, so that would have to be done very quickly. Mm -hmm. OK, so I'm just looking. I've actually got a Google app up at the moment, so I'm having a, a little look at it to see how much of the. So we, the north bit could actually still be open, uh, Madam Convener. We don't know if that fence is there or not, and so that would give them access uh, to that open space at the moment. You know, um, well, it is. Uh, to the north and what they should do in the future is put planning in permission for a, a fence, another additional fence to the north and the one down the east, and that would make the site secure. I would have thought, but again, I'm not. Yeah. Bear in mind, it's not for the local review body to find solutions to yeah. the I know. concerns. <laughs> We're simply reviewing that. Trying to find a balance, so, uh, you know, um, OK, so yeah, does that help <laughs> you ask in the picture? Yeah, just I'm just trying to look at see what the op, you know don't have to leave the the, the developer with 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 some options. Um, I mean, there's no reason why the fence can't go down the uh, up the east side and then go immediately west at the corner of the building. Uh, well, that 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 well, you've just to determine that that would be for them to decide if they want to do that. Yes, depending indeed. on what the outcome is of today's decision. So I suppose really that's just resolving the situation, and we're not in that position to do that, Dick. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but I mean, by, by allowing the fence to go continue north, we're, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, we're losing yeah. open space at the north. Yeah. Are we yeah. not? I know where you're coming from. No, 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 no. Sorry, I, I'm not sure if there's been some misapprehension, but the, the officer's report and its reference to the the loss of access to an area of open space is talking about this area here only it's not talking about here because ah, that it's not talking about there, no because that it's historically about what you're now, sir? here that bit you're talking about that bit did you see yes. your... this yes uh -huh, that's why the thought. officer's report is talking about the bit this sliver of land ah uh, yeah down the side well, there's a fence here this already. area to the north of the building yeah. has historically been enclosed by a fence i cannot confirm whether it is currently enclosed by a fence because I don't know whether this what was previously here has been removed or not with the construction of this new fence. But the point is this hasn't operated as an area of publicly accessible open space, so nothing is being lost. OK, uh, that, 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 that's that's what I'm trying to get to. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I've gone a long way around, but I think I, I'm, I'm there now. OK, <laughs> OK, no problem, Councillor Mason. It's important that, you, 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 that you're clear. Um, OK, any other questions for uh, Mr Evans? OK, no. Nope. OK, so in accordance with the procedure notes circulated, uh, we will now discuss and decide the manner in which this review will proceed. And again, I would just highlight that all the representations relating to the case have been considered um, and taken into account. So Councillor Mason, we'll kick off with you first this time. Well, given given the, the, the information that you have just gleaned, and I fully I think I, I think I fully understand. Whatever took some time to get there, but we're there. Now I, I think that the the the, the solution by having a fence with with a, with a hedge in front um, can provide a suitable um, security to the, um, to the to the property owner, and but also allows for the amenity to be reason, reasonably. Um, um, maintained and and certainly better than the, the existing situation of the, of the, of the fence uh, which need is, uh, should which should be removed anyway. So I, I I'm I'm uh, given that that will take place first and then then this fence will be built. Uh, I I I I think I up, up, upheld the applicant. Up, applicant. Okay, Councillor Donnelly. Yeah, I'll go with the appellant as well. <laughs> the applicant as well. I think we've got there eventually. Um. I mean, it's quite densely forested, isn't it? I mean, uh -huh. um, I mean, I, I don't know who 
we want particularly access to it. Um, just perhaps, the, as I said, go with it. Um, with perhaps some conditions, the officers could look at the, the Bob Wire issue. If it isn't, we can't force that, perhaps green coated or black coated or whatever. And also, um, you know, let's see um, what's a different, you know, where we progress with the um, with the uh, with the order for to remove the unauthorized fencing. Because I mean, if it was taken down, it would give a bit more open space. If you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it would open it up more because they're tighter to that building with this proposed fence. So I'm not quite sure where the determination of a reason would be, whether it would be an improvement to the present situation or whatever. But I'm sure that. Uh, We'll get advice from Gavin about that. OK, all right. Thank you, members. Uh, again, you know, it, it is, uh, I hate to use it, a fine line on, on this one. However, you know, it's not about approving. It's not about improving what currently is in place because it's unauthorised and need, it, there's enforcement against it. So it's about what should be <laughs> there uh, and adding a new fence. Um, I agree with you, Councillor Donnelly. I think the barbed wire would be out of keeping, and I think I understand what you're saying is like a, a, a bit like that to save yeah. people climbing over. But if people really wanted in, they would just snip the fence. Um, again, I would be um, wanting some level of condition around the the finish of the fence because I think galvanised steel is 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 not the most attractive, and it is um, out of keeping. And regardless of whether you've got um, a black thorn hedge in front of it, that'll take time to mature. And I think a, a black or a green um, coated fence would disappear into to the background far easier. I mean, we, we sort of say, well, who who uses uh, these pathways? And, it, you know, it's people with small children and dogs who like to run in through trees and stuff. So I think it is important to have that area that separates from the path for kids and dogs to explore. So I do think it's important that we maintain as much of the open space as possible. And I understand absolutely, Councillor Mason, where there was the, the, the slight confusion over the top element, you know, and having looked at it on a map as well, it does just lead into like another industrial site with pipes and various other things. So it wasn't actually leading anywhere, although it is important for, for sort of the biodiversity and the creatures moving about that we don't have any blockages. But as we've heard that that wasn't part part of, uh, of the consideration of that for this application. So I think that, um, you know, any nine which we've said, you know, is quite an important one on this. I think that the improvements have been made by the applicant and giving, re you know, recognition to the comments made by the reporter on the previous fence. I think we've found that kind of halfway house um, and, you know, I'd be, um, content to overturn the app, the officer's recommendation and support the applicant with sensible conditions and maybe Mr Evans you could advise us of what you think would be appropriate having heard what we've said. Thank you Chair. Um, yes I, th I think it would be um, competent to attach a condition saying you know notwithstanding the, the fencing detail shown um, the barbed wire portion should not be should not be installed. Um, whether you actually need to um, require submission of details or not in terms of the, the colouring is another matter. You could either have it that details have to be submitted for agreement and sort of give an indication of what you expect, or you could be specific and say that it has to be, for example, green coated um, mesh fencing or black coated mesh fencing. It's up to you whether you you have particularly strong feelings and want to be specific to that degree. Yeah, I think probably we would just leave that to the, to the planners to agree with the applicant because there's things move on and there's often other equivalents. But you know, we're looking at instead of bare steel, we are looking at something that um, has a colour to it that would disappear into the background as opposed to stand out um, as a an industrial fence. In terms of uh, the the presence of the unauthorized fence, I was just thinking a little more on that. And whilst you whilst you couldn't sort of duplicate the enforcement mm -hmm. process by saying you have to take this fence away, what you could do is use a negatively framed condition that's specific to the new fence to yeah. say you can't install this one until you've taken away that one. If you oh, see yeah. what I mean. That's what we'd like. Yes, please. 
OK, that's great. Uh, and, and I mean, we are disappointed that given that they were told that they had to have it removed by June last year, that they haven't done that. I appreciate that obviously there's been COVID and obviously from a security point of view, they maybe felt that they couldn't do something. But, you know, um, I, th I think it would be fair to say that, you know, we would be looking for a quick response to that enforcement notice if you're having a, a casual word with them, perhaps, Mr Evans. No, that's no problem. Sure, we can okay. put an informative on just reminding them of the outstanding notice. Absolutely. OK, so with that, I think, um, Ms McBain, are you happy with what we've come up with? That's fine, can we? And I'm just scribbling down, but that's fine. So we'll unanimously overturn the officer's decision and it'll be um, approved with the conditions that we've discussed. OK, super. Now, Thank I you. believe that you finished with us, Mr Evans, and we are going to hand over to Mrs Green. That's right. Thank you very okay. much, everyone. Uh, Thanks. See you on Monday, Evan. <laughs>to consideration of the third review in respect of the decision to refuse the application for the formation of a link dormer to the rear and replacement windows to the front side and rear at 57 Blenheim Place, Aberdeen, planning 211241. We will now hear from the planning advisor, Mrs Lucy Green, who will provide us with a brief description of the application proposal. Again, I'd point out that Ms Green attends today's meeting to provide us with the necessary professional planning guidance because she's not been involved in the earlier consideration of the application under review. Ms Green will, however, not be asked to express any views on the merits of the proposed development and effect her role will be a neutral one involving the provision of factual information and guidance only. Ms Green. Thank you, convener. I'll just share my screen. It's there, yeah. Sorry, I've lost my notes there. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. um, this relates to request for review against an application refused under delegated powers for the formation of Dorma to the rear and installation of replacement windows at 57 Blenheim Place, Aberdeen. So the review has been submitted with all the necessary information within the time limit of three months following the decision of the appointed officer. Um, the applicant originally indicated on the notice for review that there were no new matters um, that had been raised in the review submissions. Um, the applicant had included a list of similar applications with the review documents and subsequently it was requested that a further case be added to the list, with the reason being given that the decision on that application had been made since the review receipt date, so since the review had been submitted. Um, details of that case were submitted with some commentary, um, and it's now for members to decide whether you wish to consider that information, and that's the information that's in the agenda um, it's called extra information and it relates to 56 Fountain Hall Road. OK, um, Mr Thompson, can I just again, just for completeness, just take you in to give the, the, the I know it's the same information, but I think it's important to remind members. Yes, of course. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, just um, further to what was said at the start of the meeting. Um, generally, the, the statutory provisions prohibit the inclusion of information that wasn't before the the, the decision making officer. Um, however, if the applicant can demonstrate that um, the information that couldn't be raised before the time of the local review body or if there's exceptional circumstances why it should be included, um, then the local review body can consider that. Um, again, I'm happy to advise on that um, legally legal advice privately if that is what the body requires. Thank you. Again, just because we're recording it, um, can we just have clarification on the dates? Um, in terms of the approval of the one you've mentioned at Fountain Hall um, and the date that this review or, or application was determined. Is that, have you ever got that handy? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll have to just check the dates. Um, we did we did look at them and, and it was the case that it had been approved since the submission of the review, but just one moment.
Sorry, it'll take me a minute to just find That's the. Okay. Do you know if that was a delegated decision? Sorry. Yes, it was. OK, thank you. Application was validated on the 21st of January. Um, just get the decision date. Thanks. The decision was issued on the 28th of February. Okay. Um, And this notice of review was received on the 21st of February. Okay, okay that's fine. Okay, folks. Um, and the sorry, so the, the first date you gave was that for the, the determination of this and then the review notice. So when was Fountain Hill, Fountain Hall? That was determined on the 28th of February. Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, so that's fine. Sorry, and this was submitted on the 21st. OK, yes. I just want to make sure I'd written that down properly. Yeah, OK, right. That's fine. Members, we obviously I mean, we won't necessarily rely solely on this information that's extra, but I would have thought it would be reasonable um, and happy for Mr Thompson to suggest otherwise for us to take it in as as part of our decision making process. We do have a list of others that are um, already being provided by the applicant, um, so it's really members for yourself do you want to take it i mean to be honest i'm 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 happy either way but i think date wise you know we he couldn't have provided it to us earlier because it didn't exist so do you want to have that information about the fountain hill uh, fountain hall sorry I keep calling it or or not i'm happy to include it as part of the decision okay councillor donnelly Okay. Yes. Sir. All right. All right. And, and you're content, Mr. Thompson, that we're, we we've kind of passed the test, if you like, in terms of determining to take it. Yes, going to be there. Thank you. That, that my advice is going to be that um, I think it's been demonstrated that it couldn't have been considered at the time. Um, so I, I, I support your decision. I think that's fair enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Okay. Um, I'll hand over to Ms. Green. Um, over to you. Okay. Um, can you see the, the slides again? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, in terms of the procedure by which the review will be conducted, the applicant has expressed the view that the review should not proceed on the basis solely of the information provided, but with the further procedure of a site visit. Um, so I'll provide some background information before handing back to you for a decision on that. Thank you. That's showing the location plan. Um, so the application site is located, as you can see, on the western side of Blenheim Place, immediately across the junction from Osborne Place and adjacent to a car park which relates to the Blenheim House office building. And it backs onto a rear lane that runs behind Blenheim Place and Fountain Hall Road. The property is an upper floor flat that forms part of a traditional granite two storey semi detached property. Um, all the windows relating to the upper floor flat are white metal sash and case units. Um, the rear west roof slope contains two painted dormers which mirror the adjacent property. Um, and the surrounding area is characterised by properties of similar architectural character. And the site lies within the Albine Place and Rubislaw Conservation Area. So I'll just show you 
That's the aerial photograph of the site, and this is the building here. Um, if you can see my cursor with the two peended dormers on the roof there. It's the 3D visual showing the two to two dormers in question there. I'll move on to give some details of the proposal. Um, so permission is sought for the extension of the existing dormers to the rear, elevation of the building and the installation of replacement windows to the front, rear and side. Um, this is the existing plan with the two dormers. Um, and then the dormer extended across the back as proposed. And in elevation, the existing proposal. And, and then the proposed dormer. Uh, basically fills in the space between the two existing. Um, so it's proposed to infill the area between the two end halfets of the existing dormers, um, forming a dormer which would be a maximum of 6.8 metres in width. And the infill area would consist of an additional sash and case window and slate roof tiles. The pitched roofs of the existing dormers would be removed and a flat roof created, finished with a grey single membrane, giving the dormer a maximum height of two and a half metres. And the replacement windows, um, those would be existing metal replaced by timber sash and case double glazed units. That's the side elevation. Showing the dormers. And that's uh, just a detail of the replacement windows. <coughs> so the appointed officers uh, reasons for refusal. Um, these are stated in full in the decision notice in the agenda pack. Um, but they make reference to various factors. The removal of traditional dormers being contrary to the Householder Development Guide and Historic Environment Scotland's Managing Change Guidance on Roofs. Um, that the mass of the dormer on the roof, which is visible from the lane and the car park, um, that the proposal would be at odds with the context of the and with other alterations along nearby rear elevations, and that proposal would be detrimental um, to the character of the conservation area, and therefore it would be contrary to policies on design, residential areas, historic environment and amenity. In terms of planning history, um, let's see, sorry, I've just jumped a slide there. Um, there was a previous application for a rear dormer which was refused and the decision was held, upheld at LRB. Um, and there are a couple of minor differences between the two proposals, which are noted in the officer's report as being um, the change in the material of the halfets and the vertical panel in the middle of the dormer from larch cladding to slate, and um, the projection of the eaves was reduced slightly. <coughs> so that was in uh, 2000. Oh, 2020. Yeah. Um, in terms of consultation, uh, there was just the community council with no comments received and there were no representations. So. Um, I'll just cover the appellant's case for review. Um, Firstly, that in relation to others, similar proposals locally, um, the view that this dormer is unsympathetic is subjective. Um, that the dormer fits between the halfets of the existing and involves an extra seven metres squared of roof. That the proposed dormer is 24 metres squared on a roof of 63 squared metres, and that's not considered um, a considerable mass. Um, the appellant makes reference to other alterations in particular at number 30 and then the more recent decision at 56 Fountain Hall Road. 
um, that the householder design guide is guidance and should be applied flexibly. Um, that the planning authority had advised in respect of this proposal that any further development over and above the existing peander dormers um, on the roofscape would be unacceptable. And uh, the applicant felt that that was intransigent. Um, that there's there were references made to applications for roof terraces at the adjacent office building and that materials proposed are in keeping with the building and the ends of the dormers would be retained. So that's um, the applicant's case. Um, so I'll now hand back to you, convener, for the panel to decide how you wish to proceed um, with respect to the site visit. OK, thanks very much. Um, Sorry, my, my screen just went blank there. OK, members, we now need to consider whether we have sufficient information in front of us to take a decision on the application. Members will note that the applicant has stated in the review document that a site visit should take place before determination. Uh, members, remember that if you do not feel you have enough information to take the decision, you can request a site visit be undertaken or that further written information be provided or a hearing be arranged. Um, could I maybe just ask before we, we made that decision, Miss Green, could you take up a sort of like a, a, a street view of from looking down so we can see the slightly wider area, which is often helps us determine whether we feel, because uh, I think we'll all probably know it, but it just gives us probably a better view. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the sun off my computer. Um, yes, I can do that. Thank you. on the second site there. Um, so do you want to see the 3D? Yeah, please. Thank you. It just gives us a view along the the, the, the length see. of the, the road to see what they what exists. Um. Okay. So that that would be the back of Blenheim Place. Um. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Um, Councillor Mason or Councillor Johnny, is there anything you want to see from the the pictures while well, um, the screen's got it up? I'm fine, I'm happy with that. OK, is that helpful for you, Councillor Mason? So, be here on there. That's useful, yes. Although, can you can you just go east across Denham Place? Well, the, the rear of the property is opposite, is that? Yeah. Hold it there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's that's okay. good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, okay. Lucy. OK, members, um, obviously we've seen that there has been a, requir a, a request for a site visit. Councillor Mason, do you feel you've got sufficient information? I haven't seen that. I'm, I'm happy with what we've got. Thank yeah, you. Councillor Donnelly? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. I know uh, Rosemount and Queen's oh. Cross. OK, thank you. OK, uh, back to yourself, Ms Green, if you could go through the, the relevant policies and considerations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the site lies within an area zoned under policy H1 residential areas in the um, 2017 local development plan. Um, so there are various criteria for um, proposals within such an area. Um, 
do they constitute overdevelopment and what is the impact on the character of the and amenity of the surrounding area? Um, obviously, there's no loss of open space in this case. And then the last criteria, does it comply with supplementary guidance, which would be the householder guide in this case? Come back to that in a second. Um, in terms of character and amenity, policy D1 on design is relevant. And um, obviously that states that high standards of design with a distinctive sense of place and um, appraisal of the context. Policy D4 on the historic environment is obviously also relevant as this is in a conservation area. Um, states that the council will protect, preserve and enhance the historic environment um, and offers support for high quality design that respects the character of the conservation area. Just moving on to the householder development guide. Um, these are general um, points of guidance within that um, architectural compatibility uh, not dominating or overwhelming the original house. Um, the case officer didn't suggest privacy and daylight as a as an issue, and then um, approvals predating this guidance do not represent a precedent. And then if we move on to the specific guidance for dormers, um, it reiterates some of those general points about architectural compatibility. Um, the precedent is the second point. Um, states that new dormers should respect the scale of the building and not dominate or overwhelm the roof. And then this point that I've just put in bold um, on traditional properties, original dormers must be retained and repaired and removal or replacement of larger dormers not permitted. Um, these are the guidance points which relate to dormers on the rear elevations of older properties um, and give various uh, sort of detailed guides on the size. Um, and the case officer's report sort of states that the dormer wouldn't um, sort of contravene these detailed points of guidance. So in terms of Scottish, Scottish planning policy, um, the proposals in a conservation area and so should preserve and enhance the character. Um, and it's worth noting in terms of the conservation area that the, the um, under the proposal, the application properties roof would no longer match the neighbours. Sorry, I just jumped. Um, the Historic Environment Scotland's Managing Change Guidance on Roofs. So that emphasises the importance of roofs as elements that define the character of buildings. Um, it states that dormers and roof lights should be appropriately designed and it um, states that early historic dormers should be retained. Just moving on to the Albine place and Rubens Law Conservation Area character appraisal. Um, so the, the sites um, located fairly centrally within the conservation area, which includes um, Queen's Road and the appraisal notes the presence of dormers on many of the villas. <laughs> Finally, um, points for consideration. Um, obviously, should have regard to the local development plan policies and any other material considerations which are relevant to the application. Um, and the following key points are, are relevant. The site is zoned under H1 policy for residential areas. So do members consider that the proposed dormer would adversely affect the character or amenity of the area? Um, do the proposed alterations accord with the relevant householder design guide? Um, and of particular relevance is the mention of the removal of traditional dormers. In terms of historic environment, do members consider that proposed works would pre preserve or enhance the character and amenity of the conservation area um, as required by national guidance and the policies on historic environment in the local development plan? 
So overall, does the proposal comply with development plan when considered as a whole, or are there material considerations that outweigh that? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Green. Um, questions, Councillor Mason, do you want to go first? No, I mean, I've got no questions at this point. Okay, Councillor Donnelly. No question this as well. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That's not like you. Um, okay, no, to be honest, uh, I don't have any questions um, either. I think it's been laid out quite clearly. Um, okay, if there's no questions for um, the screen, we obviously now um, have to consider how we um, determine this application. So in accordance with the procedure note, so we, I would highlight that all representations relating to the case have been considered and taken into account. So, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Vina. Yes, I mean, the guidance notes are fairly clear in terms of dormers and, the, and, and this, this particular property you know, has a traditional two dormers in the roof, so does the next door one, and to, so do almost all the houses on Blenheim Place and, and both both on, on this the side of this property and this, across the street. And there's one combined dormer um, on uh, across the road um, further up to the north, but that's the only one of, of that of that of that block. And and I, I and and uh, you know the, we, the, the the rules are very clear in terms of maintaining the quality of the dormers or, or you know, traditional within the roof space. So I, I I I'm really not can't cannot see this this we should accept this particular appeal. Okay, okay thank you, Councillor Mason, Councillor Donnelly. Yeah, I know. I, I sympathise with the, the applicant over the challenges of um, of replacing, you know, windows in the in granite type buildings, Sasson case, and all of this. I have a conservation area part of my own constituency. But again, with this, I just feel that um, it doesn't tone in um, with the other um, dormers that have uh, terraced to the property. Um, it would stand out. Um, um, it's well, and you would keep using the word unsympathetic. The, the proposal, and I have to agree. I just think that it is unsympathetic, and that the the two historic dormers that they've they've got, you know, and um, are traditional, and to remove them, I, I don't think, um, you know, I think it would be a retrograde step. Wouldn't be positive at all. Um, no longer makes the neighbours. Um, you know the same um, as the character to the building as well. If it was, if it was, uh, if they were removed into one block type of uh, double dormer, so I'm I'm going with the officer's report that uh, we should refuse on those grounds. That it just doesn't uh, the removal of traditional dormers in the conservation area, particularly that it's it's not it's not it's not it's not feasible. It's not on to me at the moment. Okay. Um, I think again we'll probably be unanimous on this because um, you know I think the the the, the current dormers are actually a very good um, reference point of the period there, and the fact that we have that whole row that have the same dormers. Uh, and, and I remember uh, an LRB actually in your ward, uh, Councillor Donnelly, where there was an attempt to replicate what was there with a with a joining bit in the middle. But it retained the peak and everything else, so you know, um, it made it made a a good attempt at replicating replicating what was there. And I I do understand about applicants wanting to make the house suitable for you know the twenty first century, but for me this we wouldn't be doing um, what we should be in terms of protecting and preserving and enhancing the conservation area, particularly when we have a whole row. Uh, um, along there with the same window style uh, and it is just the rear that I have the, the issue with so it is with with regret that you know we don't want people not to be able to to maximize the use of their house but I think on this occasion that the impact um, when we're looking at H1 whether it would have an unacceptable impact in the character of the conservation area I think I would have to say yes it does and I think the other um, elements that were laid out um, in the refusal notice actually equally apply. So I would be again upholding the officer's recommendation. Um, Mrs. McBain, do you need anything else from us? Thanks, convener. No, that's fine. So I will um, 
we've unanimously agreed to refuse the appeal and go with officer's recommendations as were stated. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, members. All right, turning to the final um, application, which is the fourth application in respect of a non-determination of an application for detailed planning permission with the change of use from the conversion of cl offices class four to form 16 uh, residential flats, including the removal of the existing link to form a separate build, to form separate buildings, various alterations, the formation of parking to the rear and the installation of railings to the front at 31 to 32 Albine. Um, place Aberdeen, planning reference 210311. We'll now hear from the planning advisor, Ms Green, who will provide us with a description of the application proposal. Again, I point out that Mrs Green attends today's meeting and provide us with a necessary professional planning guidance because she's not been involved in any consideration of the application. Ms Green will, however, not be asked to express any views on the merits of the proposed development and, in fact, her role will be a neutral one involving the provision of factual information and guidance only. Over to yourself and screen. Thank you, convener. Right, um, I'll share my screen. OK, um, so this relates to the request for review against the non-determination of the application for change of use from and conversion of offices to form 16 residential flats including the removal of the existing link to form separate building, a separate building, various alterations, the formation of parking to the rear and the installation of railings to the front at 31 to 32 Albine Place. Um, the review has been submitted with all the necessary information within the time limit following the agreement of an extension of time for the determination of the application. Um, the applicant has indicated on the notice of review that there are no new matters have been raised in the review submissions. And in terms of procedure by which the review should be conducted, the applicant has expressed the view that the review may proceed on the basis of the information provided. So I'll now provide some background information to the case before handing back for discussion and any questions. So that's the location plan. Um, the property consists of a pair of semi-detached traditional granite built dwellings, former dwellings. These were later converted and extended for office use and are located within the Albine Place Rubislaw Conservation Area. The buildings are not listed. Um, they sit on a north-south orientation with their formal frontage to Albine Place, and they're set behind a, a garden and driveway. Um, and the full site extends to 2,520 square metres. I'll just show you the aerial photograph. Um, you can see the property there of the two buildings fronting onto Albine Place. There's Albine Lane at the back. the street view image of the front of the property. Let's see if I can a bit bigger without don't seem to have a happy medium there. <laughs> <laughs> um, street view from October 2020. Um, you can see the buildings just behind this large tree. Where's the connection? Or is it to the rear? Is it? Yes, yeah. that, that's uh, from the rear there, the 3D image. Mm -hmm. So this Albine place up here, and this is the um, modern extension to the rear. Okay. Good. So the original building is one and a half storeys in height over a basement. Um, Original doors and windows are still present within those properties. Metal railings still present on the stepped access to the front. Um, and there's the large mature beech tree that we just saw in the previous slide, um, which is covered by the same tree preservation order as the other trees along Albine Place. Um, to the rear, as we can see on this slide, due to levels, the building is two and a half storeys. Um, that's the original frontage building. Um, and there's the large brickwork rendered three-storey structure 
previously built for and used as an office extension. And this rear structure was originally linked, which it's shown in that image um, to the semi-detached properties, but the two links shown have been removed by the applicant. Um, so the rear um, office building is accessed from the car park, um, which is within the historic curtilages of properties served from Albine Lane. The building to the east there is the Albine Medical Practice, which has a two storey extension with a blank gable onto the site. Um, although it's two storey with underbuild, um, it's only slightly lower than the extension on the application site. And then to the west, there's a large extension in use as offices, and that, um, according to the report, has 10 large windows on two levels. Um, looking over the application site. There's no planning history to this site. Um, in terms of the proposal, um, the three storey office structure to the rear is proposed for retention um, and to be reclad in granite with the link removed. So these slides, um, oh, there isn't actually a key but it's assumed that the yellow is indicating demolitions so the roof of the extension would be removed along with the links um, and some of the rear wall here it's again showing extent of demolitions okay. in assumed to be in yellow and again just the full site So that's from the rear, just showing the two links uh, okay. to be removed. Why? Um, this is showing the proposal now. Um, the traditional properties to the front, which you can see um, lower ground floor level in that slide of the frontage building. Those are proposed for conversion into six flats within those two buildings, um, two on each level, basement, two in the main ground floor and two in the second floor. Um, ground floor flats would retain the original front stepped access with the two basement and two attic flats proposed to be accessed from the side and rear stairwells. Just move on to those layouts. So that's the ground floor. Um, and I'll show you the elevations in a minute. So for the flats on Albine Place, which are in the older buildings, the proposal is to include private amenity space for these flats in the form of either balconies or patios in between the historic property and the rear extension. We're just moving on to the rear extension. That's that's just showing the the modern extension. Um, it's proposed to be converted into 10 flats, two flats on the ground floor and four flats on each of the first and second floors. So that's first floor. Second floor, third floor. Um, Two of the flats on each of the first and second floors would have their bedroom and main living spaces facing east or west. I'll just go back to those. Directly onto the, so their main living spaces and bedrooms would be facing east and west onto adjacent properties. Balconies would be added to each of the flats to provide private amenity space. Um, and the balconies would vary in size. Um, from around five, around 12 square metres to around 25 for flat seven. Um, the new stairwell is approximately 2.3 metres from the rear structure. Um, that's the new stairwell. You can just see the edge of it at the top here. Okay. Um, and for the flats in the rear structure, private amenity spaces in the form of patios and balconies. 
Tapi <laughs> That's the proposed roof plan. And this is just looking at the the rear of the frontage building, so the traditional buildings with the staircase and the balconies. And then side elevations. So this is Albine Place. And that's the rear extension reclad. It's again Albine Place here on this side. Yeah. So sorry, Lisa, can I just check in terms of the, the height of the 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 sort of this rear old newer building as opposed to the old one? Did you say is that that's got an extra floor on top? Is that right? Or am I just I'm trying to because um, yeah. I know it said demolition was shown the top bit. Yes. They, just, or is, is it going to be still be the same height and just for a new type of roof? Uh, yes, it would be the name same height. Um, that was an amendment. The, previously, there were two stories added to the top, but it would be it's just removing the roof and replacing it. OK, that's fine. I just want to double check my understanding. Thank you. And that's the proposed rear elevation um, to the to the south. Okay. And that is the north elevation. So the elevation that would face the back of the traditional properties. So the in between the two, this would be the elevation um, with the green wall and windows with a paint glazing. And that's the frontage onto Albine Place. Um, I'll just go back to the layout plan. <coughs> I'll just run through these actually but before I go to the layout plan. Um, so that's the Albine Lane elevation as proposed these darker grey are the existing buildings yeah. so you can see the um the modern building here and then you can just see through to the more traditional building that fronts onto albine place sections through the frontage building sections through the rear building that's um, a section through north south, if you like. So, traditional building would be here. Okay. And then site sections. So, that's looking through the two buildings with Albine Place here. And then the two side elevations. And then moving on to the site plan. Um, so there'd be uh, 13 parking spaces to the rear with a further three informal spaces available to the Albine Place frontage. No changes are proposed to the ingress and egress to the front and the entrance to the rear is also as per the existing situation. The site would also provide bike storage, including additional visitor cycle parking provision and bin storage. Located between the parking court and the rear structure would be a communal area of amenity, approximately 200 square metres in size. And there would also be a few planted flower and shrub beds on the edges of the property. Um, there were amendments, as I mentioned previously, which reduced um, the number of flats from 19 to 16 and parking was removed from the front area so that it would remain at the existing level and um, just be re-graveled. Mm -hmm. These are some existing and proposed views that were submitted. Um, this is just looking at the modern extension and the rear of the traditional building. Showing the demolition of the roof there. 
similarly showing demolition here. Same thing from the lane. So in terms of consultations, um, the waste team, the waste team's consultation really talked about the bin requirements for the new flats. Um, developer obligations team requested contributions to core paths, healthcare, open space and community community facilities. Um, the sites within the affordable housing waiver zone. Um, so that wasn't um, requested as a contribution. The environment policy team commented on a tree survey that was submitted for the mature tree at the front of the property. Um, that uh, part of the proposal has subsequently been amended so that the the area would be regravelled, but there'd be um, the concerns about forming car park there have have gone because of the amendments. In terms of the roads team. Um, the site is within the inner city boundary. So as per council guidance, the associated parking ratio would be one and a half spaces per flat, which would equate to 24 spaces for 16 units. Um, and although that's a shortfall in terms of the standards, it's confirmed uh, that the roads team were um, happy with that level of parking, given the proximity to the city centre boundary and Union Street. Um, and as well as that, the sustainable transport and cycle parking provision. Um, having said that, there was a requirement for a disabled space to be added, um, which isn't shown in the proposals at the moment. The um, Queen's Cross and Hull Law Community Council, um, they commented that following the submission of the amended proposals, um, they would encourage the planning service to look favourably on the proposal. The community Council considered that if the development didn't go ahead, there were no better alternatives likely to come forward and the deterioration of the building would accelerate to the detriment of Queen's Cross and Hull or Community Council area and the physical and vis visual amenity of residents, existing residents. So I'll move on to the applicant's case for review. Um, these points are set out in full in the notice of review statement, um, which in, is in the agenda pack. And the following points were made. Um, it was firstly stated that amendments had been made to the proposal in response to case officers' comments. Um, and those are the ones that I've highlighted already. That the proposal would bring back into use vacant buildings and the redevelopment of the whole site was necessary in order to deliver the works. That it, the proposal would contribute to the aim of raising city centre population, that the vacant offices have been marketed for some time and the proposal is just a response to the economic climate. Um, that it would involve a traditional building being restored and that residential has been confirmed as an acceptable use in principle. Um, that the site contains an existing substantial modern extension which is visible only from the rear and as part of the proposal it be reclad in granite in order to improve the appearance. Um, the applicant's agent made the point that the link building would be removed and staircase replaced with an extension which would be to the rear of the frontage building um, and that they had amended that part of the proposal to make it more transparent. Um, also, that there would be new garden areas, landscaping, car and bike parking and bin storage. Further points, um, that the concerns that had been noted about the level of amenity for future residents um, and the impact on the character of the conservation area. That uh, in terms of amenity, all flats would have external space be dual aspect and have windows looking onto landscaping and that most would have south facing windows. That this is a city centre location and amenity levels should be judged accordingly. Um, that there would be opaque glazing to windows to the north that would be to protect privacy 
of residents within the frontage building. Um, there was a sun study submitted, um, which showed that all flats would have some direct sunlight and that there were no objections, only a representation of support from a neighbour. Um, also in the agenda is the officer's draft report of handling, um, and that makes a recommendation of refusal of the application on the basis of residential amenity, outlook from the flats onto high and blank walls, privacy and lighting, um, and further reasons for recommending refusal on the basis of the lack of full consideration of the conservation area context with the proposal not suitably respecting the site's historic context and that it wouldn't preserve the character of the conservation area. So I'll hand back to you, convener. OK, thanks very much, Ms Green. Uh, questions from Ms Green? Oh, sorry, my, my thing's just gone black. Here. Hang on a sec, and I've just bit my lip, so now I've got muting lip. <laughs> Uh, right, OK, first of all, um, before we get to, to questions, can I just uh, find out if we're content to proceed? Oh, sorry. Um, with uh, the decision making today oh, and we don't require any further procedures. Councillor Mason. Uh, I'm content. Yeah, Councillor Donnelly. I'm happy. I know I'll be in place well. I used to have to strong accent, but quite, quite, quite well by place. OK, right. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Lucia. Uh, so with that in mind, if we could then just proceed uh, with the policies and considerations, Ms Green. Yes. Questions? No, we'll do questions. You've done questions? Yeah. No, we're going to do questions once we've oh, heard sorry. policies. Sorry, carry on. OK, um, so the site lies within the area zoned under policy B3 West End offices, and that policy principally supports offices being retained uh, with residential use considered on merit. So with that in mind, um, it's relevant to look at policy H1 for residential areas in order to consider the quality of the proposal for residential use. Um, and if those criteria are met, then residential use would be acceptable in principle. So there are various criteria within the residential areas policy. Um, is the does the proposal constitute overdevelopment? Um, would it have an unacceptable impact on character and amenity of the area? Would it result in loss of open space? Um, and there's no public open space affected in this proposal. And does it comply with the supplementary guidance? So um, it's worth noting in terms of consideration under this policy that um, the distance between the modern extension and the building to the west is 12 metres and the distance between the building to the east and the modern extension is 4.7 metres. That's to the um, the blank gable of the medical practice. Can you see that bit again? You just went a little crackly on my thingy. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, the distance between the building to the west and the modern extension is 12 metres. Mm -hmm. And to the east, it's 4.7 metres between the modern extension and that rear blank gable of the medical practice. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so Policy H1 also raises matters of privacy and amenity for future occupiers and sunlight and daylight would also be considered under policy H1 um, with consideration given to the proximity of all adjacent buildings and relationships of the two buildings on the site, uh, the modern and the older building. So a sunlight study was submitted um, for the applicant, which showed that in September, rooms would all rooms would receive sunlight. Um, there's also the policy on amenity in the proposed plan. Um, 
which states that no more than 50% of usable amenity space should be used for car parking. And it also uh, contains, states that occupiers, that it, it wishes to ensure that occupiers are afforded adequate levels of amenity in relation to daylight, sunlight, noise, air quality and immediate outlook. And also, that there should be minimal shading of external, private and public spaces and that occupiers should be afforded adequate levels of privacy. Moving on to policy D1 in terms of design. Um, requires development to be a, a high standard of design, which demonstrates understanding for context. And then there's the six qualities there. Policy D4 um, site lies within the Albine Place Conservation Area, where the City Council will protect and preserve the historic environment. Um, policy also offers support for high quality design, reflects the character of the conservation area. So in particular, in respect of the retention of the rear extension. Policy on landscape, um, I've just added this one in rather than just talking to it. Um, developments should have a strong landscape framework, um, being informed by existing landscape character. Um, and in particular, I suppose the last point about creating new, new landscape where none exist. Um, Technical advice note on materials and also on development along lanes. Um, the case officer in the draft report had also referred to these two in particular um, in relation to the use of granite cladding. And um, I suppose the consideration of development along lanes as a form of development within the area. And also, also the technical advice note on the repair and reinstatement of cast iron railings, um, which is proposed to the front of the building, and that just seeks um, replacement with a faithful copy of original railings. Policy D5 on granite heritage um, seeks retention and re an appropriate reuse and conversion and adaptation of all granite buildings and features. Um, policy 2.2 is on the transport impact of development, um, which talks about sufficient measures having been taken to minimise traffic generation and opportunities for sustainable and active travel. I mean, obviously the the roads team didn't have an objection to the proposal. And policy T3 on sustainable and active travel um, sites located near to walking routes, cycling and public transport. That's policy R6, which is about waste management, um, that all development should have sufficient space for storage of refuse bins. Just moving on to um, Scottish planning policy, um, and there are various relevant points within that. Um, the proposal, proposal should preserve the character of conservation areas. Um, there's a presumption in favour of sustainable development where the local development plan is beyond its five year um, time span. Um, makes point about protecting, enhancing and promoting, promoting access to natural heritage and avoiding overdevelopment, whilst protecting amenity of new and existing developments. So the proposals within the Albine Place and Rubus Law conservation area. Um, it's within area B, the same area as the last uh, application. And um, it just describes Albine Place as um, high quality houses set within their own large back gardens. That's obviously how they were built originally.
Um, so finally, points for consideration. Does the proposal comply with policy B3? Um, obviously, that was that residential uses be considered on merit. Um, and then there's the tests set out within the residential areas policy. Is the proposal acceptable in terms of amenity of future residents? Does the proposal preserve and enhance the conservation area? In terms of design, is the design quality sufficient? Having regard to the various factors noted. Um, and does the proposal consist of sustainable development um, in terms of its location, materials proposed and the extent of demolition? Overall, does the proposal comply with the development plan when considered as a whole or are there material considerations that outweigh the development plan? I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Green. Questions? Uh, Councillor Donnelly, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, I, I picked up one um, of the applicant's um, positive statements is that we, most of the flats um, would have a south facing view. I've worked out that the six flats in the main building would have a south facing view if the sitting room was to the rear, but they would look onto the new building, the existing building. And mm -hmm. I've worked out that five of the other flats and the 10 wouldn't have south facing views, they would be facing north. Mm. But am I right in thinking that? Um, that's that's what I would um consider when looking at the plans, yes, and the case officer's report does so that's indicate actually that. thirteen out of sixteen. Uh, so, so that would be that would be sort of nine. Nine wouldn't, the majority wouldn't have south facing views. And the six that did in the main building, the old building, would be looking at another building of uh, 12 metres away from. Yes. You said 12 um, metres is the distance between the, um, the distance between the existing, the LB, the, old, the original building and the, where they've taken away the, uh, the former dual passages and put, I would plan to put one stairwell. That's 12 metres and 4.7 um, metres away from the Albine medical practice, yeah? Uh, 12, 12 metres is to the west, to the built to the office. Oh, 12 metres is to the west, I see. Yes. 12 metres is to the west and 4.7 is between. to the east, which is the medical practice. Yeah. So what's the, be distance less... between, what's the distance between the existing building and the new building there? They've taken down the stairwell and proposed a new connecting well. What's that? So they'd be looking onto that piece of land, then the, the the new building in the old house, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, it it varies slightly because the rear of the building isn't. Yes, yes, of course. The right. are protruding, yeah, the bay windows, yeah, the, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to share my screen to. Um, like this is the distance, so that's the stairwell, and then that's the. So that distance are there to there. Yeah. So window, do you want window to window or balcony to? Is that just from the window? Just see, that's a south facing view. These two dormers and the existing building. They're obviously looking onto the the extension of the new part of the building. And that's yeah. supposed to have a nice south facing view, you know, with plenty of sunlight. What's the space there then? Um, well, if you can see that scale at the bottom, it's five metres. Um, five metres. So let me. 15 feet to me. That's, um, sorry, that's not the distance. I'm just, it's, it's about seven, seven and a half between the dormers and the rear. Seven, um, and, a half, seven and a half metres, 21 feet, yeah. Yeah, and that's going to be enough less for daylight, that. and you want just daylight and sunlight to get in, and even without the view on the existing building. Yeah, I mean, it, I suppose it depends on the time of year as to sunlight yeah, and how high the sun is, but yeah. So it's seven and a half meters, yeah. That's yeah. That well, that's so between that's the dormers and the rear. It would be four feet. 
it would be less than that. Pacific, three so. teams ahead of it. Yeah, four teams and four bodies. OK, that's fine. enough. Thanks very much. OK, uh, Councillor Mason. Yeah, um, interesting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> First question is, is, is this one of the first buildings converting from office office, office to along the, the, this, this stretch, so to speak? The, um, converting from office to, to, to residential? I'm, I'm not aware of others along this stretch, no. So really what becomes of this is, will be a, 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 a marker for what will, will happen to a whole load of buildings along Albine Place, I guess. I mean, to some extent, I, you know, every application is considered on merit and it would depend on the, what the, if there are similar modern extensions, they mm. may be different in shape, but to some extent it could be. Yeah, OK. And, and they the, 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 the wanted to um, um, have granite facings put on over the brick. Yes. Um, and, and there's some some policy against that because of dilution of the of the granite of edibility. Um, well, uh, uh, is it suggested any other other alternative might be other than granite? Um, I mean, I'm not I mean, sure. Why, do they, why do they need a facing at all? I mean, is is the brick being rejected as as being suitable? Um, I think granite's been proposed as a you know a traditional Aberdeen material. Um, and the technical advice note just raises questions about the sustainability of it rather than being a sort of saying no to it, um, you know, conscious that it's not a local sourced material. Um, I mean, I'm not aware that there have been discussions about a facing material as an alternative to granite because um, that when you're looking at the case officer's report, it's more about the, the form of the modern extension and should it be retained and looking at that issue rather than just the um, facing material. Mm. It, I think that point is made um, when looking at is this a sustainable development and how does the use of granite cladding sit with that particular issue? Yeah, because I mean the, most of the most of the extensions at the back of most of the offices are on sort of non-granite. They're, they're sort of a whole whole mass of different um claddings and ship shapes and, and, and designs in as much as they're all behind the, the, the traditional front um buildings yeah um, some quite successful and just determining putting granite for the sake of it it never struck me as being quite very sensible for, for at all um, but uh, what, what guidance have we got in terms of the density of of, of property um, in terms of, I mean, they're, 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 it strikes me as being they're, they're shoehorning as many, many um, residences in as they can. Um, and I understand what you know, the motivation there. They obviously need to finance the thing. But um, it, 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 there must be a balance between getting numbers of, I mean, you can cram single bed sits in if you if you really try it but i mean where, where, where what's the guidance in terms of the density is suitable in any in, in, in any location um i mean i i don't think that the density in itself would um be would contravene policies on density it's it's more the given the height of the sort of frontage building um and the relationship of the two. Um, the case officer seemed to be sort of making the point that there weren't discussions about alternative layouts that would potentially fit that number of flats in, but you know, would provide better amenity, for example, or fit better within the conservation area. So it's difficult to say in terms of density as such that there couldn't be an, a scheme of similar density that wasn't acceptable, but it's um, it's the reuse of this building um, means that it's difficult to get suitable amenity for residents because of the shape of the site. So, 
it's not a very straightforward answer. Sorry. No, no. I mean, I mean, it, 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 I mean, you've got a, It's an incredibly difficult problem to get to get the thing to fit, um, given an, an existing building of, of sorts. But I'm trying trying to. Fit, but the main issues seem to be the ones of of, of the, the, the 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 amenity being what they see from from the various apartments. And, 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 the, and the borrowing of, of amenity from overlooking other, other other people rather than having an immediate in itself. And it's just, it's, it's, it seems to be they're just stuck at balconies on, and that gives it, opens up the whole thing, provides amenity, which appears not to be the, the case in, in a lot of places that you, you seem to hit a, black, a blank wall. And even, even looking from the back of the, the old building, they're looking at a, a, a not a, not a blank well we're looking at a blank wall which is covered in green at the moment but it's not it's not particularly nice there's not there's no view there in any way whatsoever it's just a sort of a back garden a back space which could could become quite if not properly kept can, could could become quite quite um, um, ill kept I, I, I would imagine. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it out at the moment. Okay. Uh, one I can ask one more question. Uh -huh, uh, you began the screen saying that it's not a listed building at all. The original building is not listed. No, not listed, no. So possibly could somebody come in and clear the site, the whole lot? Um, they would need conservation area consent to do that um, and there's obviously policies about retaining granite buildings yeah and you know the sort of scale of a, a granite building, building. I not a list i thought most of the properties there would have been under some kind of well the conservation area or maybe to cover a bit of that life not existence yeah okay surprised it's not listed okay you said one of the things that is increasingly difficult is is bringing modern all the older granite buildings up to modern, modern oh, yeah. insulation standards and oh, amenities generally. Right. Yes, I've got a go ahead. Knocking them down is, a, is, is not far from, a, from, a, from a, a suitable option for an awful lot of buildings. I'm not so sure about suitable. <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it can't be very, insulated because yeah, all uh, slats, the, the slats because you can't get any foam insulation in them at all. I mean, I live in the granite area, so it's. They are difficult. In terms of the, the the modern part, if you like, I mean, I would have thought there would be different regulations and requirements for an office block compared to in terms of a, a residential and for things such as um, the the insulation and you know, I mean, are they, is they planning to completely strip it out? Because again, you know, there, there's been a lot of infamous things in the, the press about um, inappropriate use of office blocks being turned into residential. Um, yes, um, they are proposing to remove the internal layout mm. and sort of rebuild that to create the flats. Would the insulation be there though and everything for like a residential accommodation as opposed to um you know um office accommodation you know, without the criteria for economic materials or environmentally you know insulated materials be there <laughs> from a um, former use to a, a residential use i mean i would imagine that that can be achieved within yeah. the building if you're stripping out the interior yeah and in terms of impact from the uh, sewer water all of that kind of thing i'm assuming that's been checked is acceptable because obviously people living there as opposed to having it as an office block is very different yes um i'm not sure that i mean we would have consulted um just trying to find it. scottish water um, I mean, it would be connected to existing sewers. Um, and in terms of sustainable urban drainage, there would be more green space than for the existing office. So um, I would imagine that those can be achieved by conditions if 
just necessary. OK, I've got a couple of other questions in terms of the railings. Now, there was obviously railings at the, the very front of the, the actual house itself, but they're also suggesting railings against the pavement. You know how it used to be railings along there. Um, yes, that was mentioned, reinstating the railings. Yeah, I just want to make sure it's the street railings and not the, they seem to have ones uh, across the front of the actual house itself in the picture um there are railings around the stairs and then around the um light wells yeah the that's basement fine. where the windows would be um I, I just wanted to make sure it was also on the street <laughs> i couldn't see it i've got the application in front of me um i think it does note in one of the documents that they would install railings along the street um than that, but there isn't a design proposed for that. OK, so uh, it could be conditioned if necessary. OK. Yeah. Oh, here's the breathing details. I was just being <laughs> breaking through the, the actual application just for a couple of things. Um, in terms of um, parking spaces, you never mentioned anything about EV charging points. Um, again, that could be something that was conditioned if you were to um, okay. prove the application. And but when you said, yeah, and, and and we've got, it says that all rooms would have sunlight in September. Is that the only one? <laughs> what, what did well, that... the sunlight study was done based on September. OK. So I'm assuming, is there a particular reason you drew September? Um, <laughs> Well, studies usually cover every quarter, so mostly just picked September. It depends on how how wide a study you do. Yeah. But, okay. yeah. Well, it's just back to the sort of distance between other buildings and, and lights getting to these houses. OK, um, did I have any other ones? So just double checking my notes. And I am assuming the balconies that are being added um, are to provide the sort of amenity outdoor space. Yes, yeah. private amenity space, yeah. That's fine. OK, any other questions? No? Right, we'll kick off with you, Councillor Donnelly, um, if there's no other questions. What, deliberations? Yes, please, wait till I just